appreciate everybody coming down. Uh, before we get started, I just have uh, one quick uh, personal privilege. Uh, I want to congratulate the Titans for uh, their win. <laughs> it's a big deal. Uh, it's been a long time since we've been here, so I hope that everybody watches the game this weekend and go Titans. All right. Yeah, oh, well, there's that. So we, <laughs> so, uh, I, yeah, so the vice chair has reminded me there's even more important yeah. news. And she's watching. Uh, yes, so Commissioner, uh, our, one of our very own Commissioner Blackshear has uh, had a baby today. Uh, eight pa Was it eight pounds? A beautiful little baby. And so congratulations to our fellow commissioner on having a newborn baby today. Much, uh-oh. So I, I want to, uh, just a few technical issues, is that this is a new site for us, uh, so we don't meet here all the time. Sometimes we do meet here, and so we're having some IT issues, but we're going to get through the consent agenda uh, and the deferrals, and then we may have to take a break to make sure we have uh, the IT working for the screen so that everybody can see which... Uh, uh, which items we are on. So I just want to let you know that. And then also for the commissioners, you don't have to push the button on the huh? microphones. You just kind of talk into the microphone, pull it close to you. There are live microphones all the time. So, you know, just if you could just understand that um, side conversations to, to a minimum according to our attorney. And so our first order of business is the adoption of the agenda. The agenda was sent out to the commission. Uh, the commissioners prior to the meeting, and we'll need a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. There's been a motion and a second. Any discussion on the agenda? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and the agenda is adopted. We are now on to item C, which is the approval of the December 12, 2019 minutes. And those were also sent out prior to the meeting. And is there, <coughs> is there any questions or discussion? Yes, There's been a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Mm -hmm. Ayes have it, and the December 12th minutes are adopted. We're on to item D, which is the recognition of the council members. And we just do these when um, we see the first council members come in. We'll take you by order. And so I saw Councilman Hall. What's the word Councilman Hall? Go? Oh, there he is. Sir, do you want to speak now or during your item? Sure. During that. Okay, perfect. Thank you for coming down. Uh, Councilman Taylor, do you want to speak now or du during the item? Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Council Lady Van Rees, I saw. There's Council Lady. Welcome. And then let's make sure microphone's working and. Thank you. Welcome. Um, go Titans. Go Titans. <laughs> um, hey everybody. Uh, I am here to talk about an item that's still on consent, item number 17, the Williams Avenue cottages. Um, I just wanted to, as is my um, habit, uh, to let you know that even when something is on consent, I think it's important for you to know that the community did speak on this matter. We had a, a great uh, community meeting and uh, folks uh, from the uh, Williams Avenue area uh, were present. Uh, some of the same folks that had some concerns about the uh, previous 428 Williams, which is up the road, uh, also were at the meeting and were uh, satisfied again uh, with uh, the results of um, that project, which is now going to third reading next week at the council level. Um, what is one of the most exciting things about the 319 project is that it is uh, detached uh, homes in a cottage setting, uh, which is uh, uh, very, uh, very good uh, for us to have that type of a variety of housing types on this new uh, developing uh, and uh, evolving neighborhood. So I just wanted to let you know, um, hello, um, happy new year, uh, go Titans, and uh, the community uh, has its uh, uh, wholehearted approval towards uh, the Williams Avenue Cottages project. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. We appreciate you coming down. And then uh, I saw Councilman Parker. Wait for the item. Okay, thank you, Councilman. Appreciate it. And then Councilman Hager, I saw him. 
There you are, sir. Good to see you again. New Year. Happy New um, Year. All I've got is uh, number 19. It's on the consent agenda. Those are some <laughs> retreat cottages going in on Park Circle. And uh, we had a community meeting about that, and there was probably maybe one complaint. So uh, I'm recommending passage of that. Everything else I got is being deferred for a while, and then maybe the Titans in the future, I can sell some of my Titan tickets. <laughs> Since they're winning now. <laughs> no Titans. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You're out of order. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just joking. Uh, appreciate you coming down. Thank you for the explanation. Are there any other council members? <coughs> I wanted to make sure we get... I didn't see any other. I'm sure they'll let me know if they come in. All right, so that concludes the item D. And now we're on to item E, which is the items for deferral withdrawal. Lisa. The following items are for deferral or withdrawal. Item 1A, 2019 CP 014001, on page five of your agenda. It's the Donaldson Hermitage Old Hickory Community Plan Amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 13th Planning Commission meeting. Item 1B, the associated case, 2019-Z-158-PR-001 on page 5. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 13th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 3, 2019-SP-015-001 on page 6 of your agenda. The 538 Rosedale Avenue SP. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number five, 2019 SP 047001, the Nipfer Corner SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 13th Planning Commission meeting. Item number six, 2019 SP 055001, 218 Maplewood Trace. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 27th Planning Commission meeting. Item number nine, 2019 S 080001 on page seven of your agenda a resub of the Maxim Holdings LLC property. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 13th <coughs> meeting. Item 10A, 2019 CP 014002, Donaldson Hermitage Old Hickory Community Plan Amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 13th meeting. Item number 10B, the associated case, 2020Z019PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 13th meeting. Item number 16, 2019 SP 072001 on page 8 of your agenda, the Trinity 24 SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 13th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 18, 2020 SP 003001 on page 9 of your agenda, Eagle Point. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 13th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 25 on page 10 of your agenda, 2020Z001PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 13th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 27 on page 11 of your agenda, 2020Z007PR001. This is a request in the Jolton area to rezone to MUNA. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 20. February 13th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 28A, 2020Z008PR001. This is an additional request in the Jolton area to MUNA. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 13th Planning Commission meeting. The associated case 28B, 6177P004, the Gifford Commercial PUD cancellation. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 13th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 29, 2020Z009PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 13th Planning Commission meeting. And the associated case, item 29B, 88P029001, Jolton Commercial PUD cancellation. Staff recommendation is defer to the February 13th Planning Commission meeting. <coughs> and item number 34 on page 12 of your agenda, 2020Z016PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. All right, commissioners, you've heard the items for deferral, but we'll go through the list to make sure that it's correct. And it, we, it's 1A, 1B, 3, 5, 6, 9, 10A, 10B, 16, 18, 25, 
27, 28A, 28B, 29A, 29B, and 34. Is that correct, Lisa? That's the list, commissioners. Any questions? We'll need a motion to defer all of those items. So moved. It's been a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And now we are on to item F, which is the consent agenda. Lisa. As information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. As notice to the public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. The following items are on the consent agenda. Item number two, 2018 SP 085001 on page five of your agenda. The 1313 53rd Avenue North SP. It's a request to rezone from R6 to SP for property located on 53rd Avenue North to permit four multifamily residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number seven on two, page six of your agenda, 2019 SP 071001, the Finery North SP. It's a request to rezone from IWD to SP for properties located on Gray Street and Martin Street to permit a mixed use development. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number eight on page seven of your agenda, 2019 SP 073001. 429 Houston Street. It's a request to rezone from CS to SP zoning for property located on Houston Street and Humphrey Street to permit a mixed use development. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 14, 2018 SP 023001 on page eight of your agenda. Maxwell Station. It's a request to rezone from R6 to SP for property located on Goins Road to permit 121 multifamily units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 15, 2019 SP 018002, the 640 Merritt Avenue SP amendment. It's a request to amend a specific plan for property located at 640 and 714 Merritt Avenue to permit a mixed use development. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 17, 2020 SP 002001 on page nine of your agenda. The Williams Avenue Cottages. It's a request to rezone from R10 to SP for property located on Williams Avenue to permit 28 detached multifamily residential <coughs> units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item 20A, 2020 SP 006001. A request to rezone from CS to SP for property located on Shergard Way to permit a residential development. Staff recommendations <coughs> to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item 20B, the associated case, 93P023003, Gateway of Hermitage PUD cancellation. Staff recommend, it's a request to cancel a portion of a planned unit development overlay district for property located on Shergard Way. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 21, 174P012, on page 10 of your agenda, Hickory Hollow PUD revision and final. It's a request to revise a preliminary plan and for final site plan of approval for property located on Hickory Hollow Lane to permit restaurant and retail space. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item 23, 2004P029001, on page 10 of your agenda, Nolansville Center PUD revision. It's a request to revise a portion of a planned unit development and for final site plan approval on property located on H Hester Avenue to permit a 1,100 square foot office. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item 24, 2019Z 160PR001. It's a request to rezone from CS to MULA for property located on California Avenue and Centennial Boulevard. Staff recommendation is to approve. 
item 26 on page 11 of your agenda, a request to rezone from RS5 to R6A for property located on Oneida Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 30, 2020Z010 PR001 on page 12 of your agenda, a request to rezone from RS10 to R10 for property located on Cardinal Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 31, 2020Z012 PR001, a request to rezone from IWD to MUG for property located on Cumberland Bend. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 32, 2020Z014 PR001, a request to rezone from CS to RS 3.75 for property located on 44th Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 35, 2020Z017 PR001 on page 13 of your agenda. A request to rezone from R10 to OL zoning for a portion of property located on Edmondson Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 36, 2020Z018 PR001. A request to rezone from RS5 to R6A for property located on Edith Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 37, 2020Z025 PR001. It's a request to rezone from IR to MULA for property located at 4900 Centennial Boulevard. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 38, 2020Z026 PR001. A request to rezone from AR2A to RM9 for property located on Mount View Road. Staff recommendation is to approve. And under other business on page 14, item number 39, an order granting subdivision approval of 2018S-204001, Hunter's Run. Item 40, contract renewal for Anita McCaig, Peter Berg, Joni Williams, and Miranda Clements. Item number 41, a new employee contract for Van Simone Holder. And item number 45, to accept the director's report. All right, Lisa, I have one question. What about item number... 19. We had a request that it be removed from consent. Perfect. All right, commissioners, these are the items. Make sure I get these correct. They are on the consent agenda. Items 2, 7, 8, 14, 15, 17, 20A, 20B, 21, 23, 24, 26, 30, 31, 32, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, and 45. Is that correct? Yes. All right, commissioners, you've heard those items on the consent agenda. Uh, we'll go slow here to make sure anybody has any questions. Any yes, Chairman. Uh, I have a s couple of questions. Yeah, Commissioner. Yes. Uh, one uh, question is uh, item number seven, and I believe uh, that is a conceptual uh, SB, and uh, the comment was a uh, height or mass of the building <coughs> is a maximum of f five or six street and height was defined. Uh, the comment from the neighbor was it was too big. So, but if, since this is a regulatory uh, SP, if a community and a council member in charge is start working, they can reduce uh, the mass and height. Is that correct? Uh, this would establish the heights that they are permitted, and so this regulatory SP is establishing heights of um, the maximums or what are uh, indicated, and so if approved, they would be able to go up to that. And so that's what's established by the regulatory plan or the maximum heights. And the, the heights we found to be consistent with the Wedgwood-Houston-Chestnut Hill recently adopted um, supplemental policy, given that this was on the one of the lowest sites in the in the policy area and they're adding active uses along the front. But I, may I clarify and make sure I understood, are you asking if the council member could further restrict the heights from what we approve? Did I understand that correctly? Yes, with there, yes. is there in that possibility? If it goes to council, then council could further restrict 
Heights through the council process. They, they could amend the SP um, as long as it is more equally or more restrictive than what you all have approved. Yes, yeah, th that was my understanding. Just wanted to make sure there's still that kind of possibility. Thank you. So move on to the next question. Uh, item number 17, 18, 20, and 35. Uh, all this consent, in this it was uh, mentioned a uh, stream or a flat way, flat buffer <coughs> was in the property. And some uh, building placement uh, without saying uh, will be away from those uh, sensitive uh, area. But it's not really specified as a condition, but I think it's, it's you know, without saying. But I want to make sure, even though it's conceptual when it comes to final uh, approval or final building permit process uh, via a stormwater uh, review, uh, if uh, the placement of the building does not meet uh, with uh, stormwater regulation, uh, they are uh, ordered to adjust the placement of the building or adequate buffer and so forth it, when time is appropriate. I missed all of the numbers. <laughs> no, yes, yeah, 17, I'm 18, sorry. 20, and 35. All of those uh, items are mentioned. Uh, there's a stream or a flat way or a flat plane on the part of the parcel. So 17 is a detailed site plan, and mm -hmm. they have indicated that it is all outside of those buffer areas on the plan. So that one's not a regulatory SP. Mm -hmm. It's a site plan-based SP, and they are, without, uh, they are outside of the regulatory buffers as required. Um, 18 was deferred. Okay. Um, 20. While you're looking, generally I would just say that stormwater is deeply involved during the permitting and final site plan right. process. And so they require that you meet those regulations and they have a whole assessment process. Yes, I myself I had uh, experience, yeah. even though it was approved when they are going into building permit process, actually calculation has a little bit error, so they had to reduce and further uh, you know, place the building farther from the buffer. So just want to make sure it was not written, but it's a given. It, yes. The, all of them, all any SPs will require a final site plan, and that's where we get the detailed construction drawings, and our stormwater division is heavily involved in those and making sure it meets all of the re regulations. And so even if it's not specifically listed as a requirement, um, that is required when they review the detailed building permits. Um, 20A is a regulatory SP, and so mm -hmm. those detailed plans will be yes. reviewed at that time. Um, 35 is a straight zone change, and so that would be reviewed at building permit phase. Okay, thank you. Uh, at the one last item, uh, item number 30. Um, I may have to pull this uh, from the consent agenda uh, because uh, the interpretation of the um, policy and the change of the zoning, I am not sure if it's meet with uh, the policy uh, in that uh, area. So if I may, I would like to pull uh, item number 30 for uh, our discussion. All right, we'll consider item 30, pull it off the consent agenda. Anything else, Commissioner? That's it. Okay, any other questions? I want to make sure everybody gets, don't want to pass anything without. Lots of questions, yeah. Yes. Vice Chair? Uh, following up on the first one, item seven, the, the other key thing that came up in the comments had to deal with the alley width. Um, is that, I know again, you said this is a regulatory <coughs> SP, but as, would, would alley width be addressed? So they are updating the alley per the requirements of our public work standards. Okay. And so especially in urban areas where we have an existing alley network, we want developments to take access from those alleys. It, it allows us to create a more pedestrian friendly environment along the front. And so they are simply bringing the alley up to the required standard of public works. So the, the properties that are on the other side of the alley behind this project would not be impacted by that. I mean, the alley behind them will become wider, but right. not on their property. On their It'll property. be on this property. Okay. Okay. Anything else, Commissioner? So I'll make sure. Vice Chair, you're comfortable. Okay. All right. So let's go over the list again. 
one more time. That way we, we know exactly which numbers for the record. So on consent, that will pass on consent. Our items two, seven, eight, 14, 15, 17, 20A, 20B, 21, 23, 24, 26, 31, 32, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, and 45. Is that correct? That's Please. Correct. Perfect. Commissioners, you've heard the items. Any other seeing no other questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Ayes have it. And those items are adopted on the consent agenda. And so for the uh, viewing public and everyone here, we are considering these particular items. So we're considering item four, item 11, 12, 13, 19, 22, 30, and 33. So eight items. All right. So before we get started into the hearings, um, I do first want to, I saw Councilman Sledge come in and uh, he has a family member with him. We are very family friendly here. So uh, welcome. And if you want to speak now or yeah, if you don't mind. I don't <laughs> mind and, and please bring all family members with you. <laughs> welcome, Councilman. Can you all hear? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Colby Slays District 17, this is our theory. It's not meant to be a political prop. It's just how daycare worked <laughs> out today. So um, the only item I think I've left is item 11. Um, that is the policy change um, regarding public hearing distance requirements for non-owner occupied STRs. Um, I know there'll be people here who will speak of that. I've got emails as well. Um, one thing I just wanted the commission to know, I think there were a couple of, co I've, I've received mixed uh, feedback from uh, all sorts of folks. Um, and mainly I think the concern from those who were opposed to it was, um, you know, how many of these properties are problem properties versus just our total property or total codes complaints. And I do want to emphasize that while there is a there is a quality of life element to this. There's also an element of how do we um, how do we determine land use and the land uses that are appropriate. So that's one of the main motivating factors in this is to say, look, we take some extra review at council for some land uses, including as this is modeled, um, uh, somebody who might be looking to sell alcohol, right, or manufacture alcohol. Um, I think that it's appropriate to have an extra level of review but it's really because it's a land use where it's come up to us several times just as some of these other land uses has that it's been requested of us as council members to be able to take another look at that i have spoken with uh, representatives of one of the local groups here that represents str owners um, we had a very good conversation about that um, and i would ask for the commission's approval but just wanted to give that sort of clarifying that yes while there is an acknowledgement that we're looking a little more closely at this use because of issues that we have received as council members. It's also just as much a, a land use review policy as it is something regarding what I will call issues we've had or problems we've had. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Arthur, for coming today. <laughs> uh, I did see Council Member Allen. Is she? You want to go later, Council Lady? You want to go or now? Oh, she just okay. Thank you, Council. You must be really bored tonight or something. <laughs> she loves I shouldn't say those things. Okay. <laughs> she loves the commission is what why she's here. Yeah. Um, so, again, uh, before we get started, though, I had some questions that popped up. We've, we've had um, a lot of complex issues come up uh, in the last several meetings. And so we have several of those complex issues tonight. Uh, and I, we have several new members, and it's always good to remind the old members, you know, kind of where our authority is and making sure that uh, uh, what council member, the council's authority is. And so I have asked uh, our director and our legal counsel to remind the commission uh, uh, about kind of where our authority lies uh, as far as um, public policy and planning 
and uh, where the, the council authority lies, just so that we all understand and so we don't waste a lot of time on issues that are not within our privy or our authority. So I think it's a good time to, to remind us um, and also remind um, the public of, of what, where those boundaries are and where the authority is. So our general counsel is gonna remind us of that. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Chairman. So um, I, I guess it's good just to talk at, at, at a, the very beginning stage, the reason that the Planning Commission reviews um, uh, these zoning bills is because you're making a recommendation to the Metro Council as it relates to the general plan, which is currently Nashville Next, and, and land use policies and how these things fit within that policy. Uh, so as you review the text amendments um, and, and all items, uh, frankly, that are being considered, the, the main purview of this commission uh, is land use, uh, zoning, and planning policies and how these text amendments will affect those policies um, moving forward. Some of the um, more operational things, uh, for example, uh, effective dates, uh, phase out, phase in periods, those kinds of the things or questions are probably more suited to uh, the Metro Council, uh, those members who are you know, duly elected by our constituents to speak on those and to hear those concerns and decide those things. Um, but as it relates to this commission's uh, uh, review and decision is mostly related to, or it's exclusively related to Nashville Next, the general plan and land use and, and planning and zoning policies. And, and that wasn't directed at, at any one particular person or instance. I just think that it was, it's good to review. So commissioners, are there any questions? I wanna make sure everybody feels comfortable and it's always good review to talk about these things and kind of know where our authority is. So, Director, you want to add anything or is that perfect? Well said. Well said. Okay. No, no questions? All right. And I think our technology issues have been resolved so we can, everybody can see. So we're on item four. Okay, this item is a request to rezone from RM40, IR, and R6 to SP zoning to permit 288 residential units for properties located along West Hyman Street. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. The property is located in North Nashville. Uh, the existing zoning is RM40, IR, and R6. The policy is T4 urban neighborhood evolving, which allows for high density residential building types placed in relation to corridors and centers that add value to the neighborhood. The policy directly southwest Hyman Street is T4 neighborhood maintenance, and the policy directly southwest of the property is T4 community center. The plan proposes a multifamily development of 288 units Three multifamily residential buildings are located along the southern edge of the site, adjacent and oriented to West Hyman Street. Six additional buildings are located behind, oriented to common amenities and open spaces. The plan includes a central park space with playground area, a clubhouse pool, <coughs> mail area, and bicycle parking. The proposed plan has internal sidewalks throughout and sidewalks with a grass strip along West Hyman Street. A traffic study has been prepared and reviewed by Metro Public Works Department. Public Works finds the infrastructure to be adequate for the proposed development and has approved the plan with conditions. The applicant has provided us with elevations for the buildings to be constructed. The maximum building height is limited to three stories and 40 feet. The plan includes standards for entrances, minimum glazing, prohibited materials, and raised foundations. 
Detailed elevations will be required with the final site plan submittal and must be consistent with the conceptual elevations, character imagery, and all the architectural standards included in the plan. The plan proposes buildings that have articulated facades addressing street and maximum height consistent with that permitted by the existing R6 zoning and the maintenance policy to the south. The proposed development provides a transition in massing and intensity between the multifamily and institutional developments on the northern side of West Hyman Street and the maintenance policy area of residential homes along the south side of West Hyman Street. Therefore, staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Thank you, sir. We'll open this item for public hearing and the applicant, is the applicant in the room? Come on up. Welcome. You've got 10 minutes and you can save two of the 10 minutes uh, for rebuttal. And the, can you, can you see the timer? Let's see. Uh, it's right up here, it's right up here. Got it, right thank yeah, you. Perfect. Uh, good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, thank you for having us here tonight. Uh, my name is <laughs> Willie Boulay. I work for Dominium, which is the proposed developer of the project. Um, just a short bit about us. Uh, Dominium has been in business developing multifamily housing since 1972, and we've grown into one of the nation's largest private providers of affordable housing um, um, in the country. Um, we are long-term owner managers um, that manage our own properties and their compliance with the various programs we operate within um, and um, often um, own and manage properties for 20 plus years, which would be the case here. Um, before I turn it over to, to Scott from Smith G, I just wanna mention a few different things about the project. Um, we've uh, had the, the, the pleasure of engaging with the community over the last seven months. We've had three different community meetings. Um, and the result of those meetings um, were a, a significant reduction in units from 400 to what you see today, 288, um, and expanded housing, affordable housing options um, from feedback from the community. So what we present to you here tonight is something everyone's had a chance to collaborate on, and I think it's resulted in a better plan. Um, just to wrap up my portion of things, as far as the affordable housing aspect goes, 100% of these apartment homes will be um, affordable to, at different housing levels between zero and 70% of the area median income. Um, we think it's a great opportunity to develop a, a, a vacant piece of land into um, housing options that uh, can add to the community over the long term. The, and the, just so you know, the restriction um, runs with the land um, that we sign and it lasts 30 years. So it's long term um, affordable housing. Uh, Scott Morden with Smith G Studio, address 1005 North 14th Street. Um, good evening, commissioners. Thank you for uh, your time and service. Uh, I'm excited to be here today to present this affordable housing project to you and the vision that it, uh, we have for it. This project has been uh, extremely fulfilling to work on and it's been a pleasure working with the community and the council member over the last seven months. There's a very involved community network there uh, and their decision making has resulted in a, a better plan for us at this point in time. This project accomplishes many policy goals for the area of T4 neighborhood evolving, including providing greater housing choices within the community and true affordability. Uh, build, it provides buildings oriented to the street in a very urban form, provides a variety of open spaces within uh, the development. It's adjacent to a major commercial center in the TSU uh, campus. It also supports local transit service with adjacency to two lines. Uh, it promotes moderate density on a major street uh, and it creates thoughtful transition uh, with the architecture and design to the single family neighborhoods surrounding it. Uh, it promotes pedestrian activity and provides uh, significant affordable housing for the community. Uh, and it, finally, at 25 units per acre, at 288 units, uh, the property falls within the density thresholds of the policy, which generally supports up to 40 dwelling units per acre in the right circumstances. The, the vision for the property overall is to provide affordable housing options for the community within a, a highly amenitized uh, uh, walkable environment. The site's really centered and anchored around a central open space uh, or a central park that'll be activated with walkways, playgrounds, seating areas, and other amenities throughout. Additionally, a large clubhouse is provided with uh, amenities for residents and a pool and community splash pad. 
a mail room, bike storage is provided as well. To support transit and multimodal access, uh, a bus stop is being incorporated within the design of the site uh, for area school children. We anticipate to serve uh, a large amount of uh, small uh, children that will be in local schools, and so that's going to be an added amenity for the community as well. And the, in addition to the internal amenities, we're really providing significant pedestrian improvements along West Hyman Street as well. The, the, this is done through a combination of design features, including a new pedestrian-focused streetscape, uh, wide sidewalk, street trees, and on-street parking. The combination of these elements will provide for a high-quality and safe pedestrian experience for residents and visitors. <coughs> Additionally, buildings towards West Hyman are set back and oriented in a very thoughtful manner in relationship to the single-family community on the other side of the street. We're having deeper setbacks and architecturally creating a smaller massing along that facade. The Central Park is really the defining feature and will really be uh, a significant component and highly amenitized. It will also provide strong connectivity to a proposed greenway that will run the entire eastern boundary of our corridor that is planned for connectivity to future properties both north and south along the rail corridor to create uh, connectivity to our urban greenway network in Nashville in the future. Last and not least, I wanted to speak a little bit about the traffic study that was commitment. There's been significant uh, commitments made and improvements done uh, both internally and externally related to traffic. A traffic study has been completed by Kimley Horn, who's available today with any questions you may have. Uh, we, the purpose of this was to ensure that we have adequate on-site capacity and provide the necessary off-site improvements to, to mitigate any impacts uh, these added housing units would provide to the network. The, the plan has really focused on three off-site improvements, and they're fairly significant. One is a new traffic signal at the intersection of 26 and Jefferson Street, which will really help the overall network at that really dangerous intersection. Secondly, we're providing significant improvements along West Hyman Street, and through expanding the travelway, creating a new on-street parking, widening the, the cross-section per the major and collector street plan, with a six-foot planting strip and a six-foot wide sidewalk uh, that will help provide a safe experience for pedestrians. In addition to this, the sidewalk is connected and extended off-site to the intersection of 26th and Hyman. This is to connect to the existing sidewalk network that is a direct connector to transit. In addition, crosswalks are being added at that intersection to help improve the pedestrian safety at that area. Um, and last is the, that's the West Time and Improvements. And so um, the community's involvement in this has generated significant response about traffic. It's been a fundamental concern from the community. And so uh, we've been taking it very seriously and have been listening and responding appropriately. Um, there are many people here today uh, that are here to speak and, and that we have worked with over the course of these seven months. Um, one of the primary discussions as part from the community has been the potential offering of a new connection to the north of our site. Um, this would be a connection that ultimately would allow the property's uh, tra travelway and vehicular connectivity to extend all the way to Walter Davis <coughs> along two different properties. It would have to transverse over two different property owners, including both MDHA and TSU. Um, the traffic study has not generated a need for this. Um, our traffic study was done at a 400 unit capacity to be a conservative effort um, versus our 288 units. And it has deemed that our two access points on West Hyman is more than enough to serve our uh, 400 units in total and, and well enough for 288. But as such, we are committed to listening to the community and we have uh, gotten agreements with both TSU and MDHA to continue conversations about that future option uh, to work with them on the details and engineering that would allow that to be accomplished. Um, and finally, uh, I will say that, you know, that is a committed added value that we're continuing to pursue. Uh, as this project continues. So with that, I will yield the rest of my time for rebuttal. Thank you very much. Thank you. You have a minute and 20 seconds for rebuttal. 
And so before we get started, we always uh, allow two minutes for the public input. We always first do uh, folks that are in support, and then we'll do folks in opposition, and then there's a rebuttal, just for explanation so everybody's on the same page. So anyone in the audience wishing to speak in support of the project? Anyone wishing to speak in support? And let's... Let's make sure. I know that there's some folks. So there's some folks maybe in the hallway as well. We'll make sure that anyone wishing to speak in support. All right. Nope. Okay. Seeing none. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up to the microphone, and then what you'll do is you'll have two minutes, and then uh, please state your name and your address, and we welcome you. And then if there's something that you want to hand uh, the staff team, well, yeah, perfect. See, easy. In the commission, you can hand it to the team. All right, thank you, sir. My name is Carl Meyer. I, uh, but talk, you got to talk into the microphone, sir. Let's start his time, time over. I live at 2407 Hyman Street, which is just across the street from this project. Uh, now, I am uh, requesting uh, five minutes for speaking in behalf of uh, an uh, organization, and I made that request. And there actually, uh, there is a comment in your kit, but this is a revised comment because of developments that have happened since Monday in this project. So uh, uh, I'm speaking in behalf of the Nashville Greenlands community, and uh, our, uh, we, uh, Members of National Greenlands Community support, actually support the application for rezoning of this property for affordable and workforce housing that we believe will be beneficial to the North Nashville neighborhood and lower income Nashville residents. It was just this morning that the applicants uh, transmitted to us letters of support from Tennessee State University and MDHA offering to allow the easements and approve construction of that additional access roadway to the north to Ed Temple Boulevard through adjacent properties owned by TSU and MDHA. And the attached map on the back of your thing shows uh, the uh, proposed uh, routes that we have suggested for this, uh, these routes. What we are asking you today our ask from you, what we're asking you today, is to set one additional commission, condition for the approval of this project. And that is that before obtaining occupancy, which might be a couple years from now after their building schedule, uh, that the applicant will have built or obtained construction of that ex additional roadway to that additional exit. And uh, I'm here with, in the last two days, we collected in the neighborhood, Tuesday and Wednesday, and I'm handing to your staff six pages of petitions with, signed by 69 of our neighborhood residents, mostly from Hyman Street, Scoville Street, and Underwood Street, the three streets that are closest and most affected by this project, supporting the request for this extra condition. And those signers include former Councilman Ed Kendall and former Councilwoman Edith Taylor Langster, both of whom live within one block of this project. Now, who are we? Uh, uh, who are we? Nashville Greenlands is an intentional network of uh, formerly vacant houses in North Nashville, which we have restored for highly affordable housing. And our members own houses at 2403, 2407, and 2409 Hyman Street that are directly across from the street from this project. And uh, 2004 Hyman, two blocks down the street, and three other houses in North Nashville that we've restored. And the explanation for our request is this. On numerous occasions, during eight months of communication with the applicants, we have suggested a workable routes for this additional access to West Ed Temple Boulevard. 
We've offered to gather a delegation of neighborhood residents, including TSU graduates, faculty, students, and non-academic employees that are members of our neighborhood organization, the North National Organization for Community Improvement. Uh, and to go to TSU with the applicant and make the case for the easements for this uh, additional exit. Uh, at three neighborhood meetings, uh, we and many other nearby residents have urged the applicants to get the approvals for this additional exit to ease the traffic stress from dumping all the units uh, onto Hyman Street. Uh, and following the December 12th meeting, I and another Greenlands resident bushwhacked along the whole routes that are shown there and determined that it's reasonably level and solid ground. Uh, it's well above the FEMA designated flood uh, zone, plain area to the north. And the shortest of the routes which we've suggested, the shortest route there from the corner of their property to the TSU paved roadway is only 250 feet. So uh, that's uh, at the most recent neighborhood meeting on January 9th, just seven days before this meeting, the applicants informed us that they had held their first meeting with President Glover and the facilities director at TSU that very day. And uh, they had gotten those letters of support, which they just delivered to us this morning. So okay. we you. want you to add that condition for the extra exit. Appreciate you coming down. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. And please give us your name and address. Okay. My name is Janet Parham, and I live at 1908 Hyman Street, very close to the West Hyman Street property. I have attended the neighborhood meetings as well as the community meetings called by our councilman. My major concern has always been the fact that there is only one way into and out of the proposed development. I have stated that fact loudly and clearly. All traffic that will enter and exit that development will only be able to do so from Hyman Street, where I live. Those entering and exiting the West Hyman Street development would include residents service trucks, postal deliveries, Amazon trucks, visitors, uh, maintenance visitors, and the list would go on and on and on. I am not opposed to people making money. I just do not want to be forever inconvenienced due to lines of traffic and problems backing out of my own driveway. I do not think that it is too much to ask that such a large development coming into our community find an additional entrance and exit from that development other than Hyman Street. It is not fair to up in our lives for other people's monetary gain. The developers themselves will not be living under the stressful conditions that they are potentially creating for the rest of us. As it is, when TSU students leave their apartments on Hyman Street going to class during certain times of the day and evening, there is a line of traffic, and it may take two traffic light changes before one can get up to the light to turn left onto Air Temple Boulevard. Upon the students' return, there is often a backup of traffic on Hyman Street because they have to swipe their ID cards or be buzzed in at the security guard gate. So I ask you, therefore, I respectfully ask you not to allow this rezoning at this time. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Welcome. Good evening. How are you? Uh, my name is Andre Johnson. I'm an attorney, and I represent John H. Odie, Jr., who owns the property at 2612 West Hyman Street. That property is a 65-unit uh, residential development that's two doors down, uh, closest to Tennessee State, and it was built in 1979. The concern, as echoed by the previous speakers, is not the development. We think it's a beautiful development. The problem is the ingress and egress, as, as previously stated. I think this picture that you're looking at is a, a beautiful rendering, but what it doesn't show is the three properties directly next to this are all high-density properties, including one that's a college property. 
And the concern that I've seen in many of these projects is you can do a traffic study, but when did you do the traffic study? In other words, this is a transient community. You can have, if you did it during the summer, well, the students aren't there in the summer. So you don't see the backlog. You don't see the people at the gates. You don't see them having to use their ID cards. The concern is that there has to be another way to ingress and egress to this property. And we believe that we don't want to kill the development. We just would like an additional condi condition added to require that before this SP is approved, that there is an additional way to ingress and egress on this property. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, uh, rebuttal and then the councilman. <clears throat> They had a minute twenty seconds, or minute. Oh, okay. Part minutes. All right, we'll just do two minutes, and I'll tell them. When. All right. Thank you, commissioners. To to respond to the the concerns um, raised here, I think um, one thing I want to reiterate is the traffic study that we performed and uh, has been reviewed and, and conditionally approved by Metro Public Works um, at four hundred units, which was what the the data was. Um, uh, set up to uh, look at uh, indicated that there was pl plenty of um, uh, uh, capacity on West Hyman. And so to that end, uh, it's not required um, per the Metro standards for a development of, of this size. Um, however, we understand and agree that uh, an additional connection um, to relieve traffic concerns and provide an additional exit would benefit not only our residents in the long term, um, but the greater community as well as the other stakeholders involved, MDHA and TSU principally with their, with their land holdings. Um, that said, making it a condition of the SP would render us unable to secure the financing through this uh, THDA, the state housing agency, and move the project uh, forward and actually provide the affordable housing. Um, so in closing, I think, you know, we want to work in good faith um, to make this happen <coughs> because we believe it is a good thing. We will commit time and resources um, for the engineering and collaboration that must take place to understand the programmatical elements that TSU and MDHA would require. Um, but making it a condition tonight would, would uh, make the project not feasible. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman? You're up. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm Brandon Taylor, Councilman District 21. Uh, thank you guys for hearing this. We've had uh, several meetings. This has been going on for quite some time. Um, prior to uh, my tenure, my short tenure as a council member, um, we've had a few meetings. <clears throat> I've held two. Um, I've talked directly with 26 members um, of the community, and uh, it's it's. Uh, the sentiments ring clearly uh, is that the community, they, they would like to have this project, this development, um, but adding the extra road would alleviate some uh, of the traffic worries and woes of the community members. Um, adding a, a condition at this moment, I'm not sure if that uh, uh, would, would be the, uh, the best possibility for us, but uh, I do believe that um, having more conversation around adding an additional exit and entrance would be helpful. So, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. And seeing no one else wishing to speak, we'll declare the public hearing closed. Vice Chair, you want to go first? I have to go first. <laughs> um, I always go. Uh, yeah, no, you do. I was very um, so uh, the applicant actually just answered one of my questions, which was whether I, th I thought there might be a timing issue associated with the financing for this, which um, given the challenges that we face in securing affordable housing in Nashville, I know that's not really one of the things we're supposed to take into account, but it resonates. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I had a couple of questions, and one is it seems to me that a new half-mile roadway would have to be on a plan somewhere. That's a pretty significant roadway. I don't assume that that's something that most private project, individual projects have to do. So if they were even to go forward with something like this, wouldn't that have to get into one of our 
street plans, or how would that be? Um, right, it's, it is a little bit complicated. There is not any sort of um, planned roadway shown there. Um, it is through TSU and MDHA property, so it crosses kind of two pieces of property that are owned by kind of private entities. Um, I think there'd have to be conversations with TSU about whether or not some a roadway through that area actually meets their future planning needs of their own campus community. Um, you know, I think that um, we look at these broadly a lot of times with whether or not we need to be providing for future connectivity um, to a site. It's not unusual for us to kind of stub out a street to an adjacent property to say that it may be appropriate for a future connection to take place, but we do um, try to look at the developments <laughs> and what they are required to provide from the standpoint of what is indicated to be needed through the traffic study. And so they scoped this traffic study and prepared it for more units than they're even proposing to build and indicated that the improvements, which are listed in your report um, and extensive, that they're proposing would serve the development. And so any sort of um, broader goal of uh, adding more street connectivity would have to be a conversation that we had it on a more global level with some of those other owners. Um, but putting the, uh, the cost and the requirement on one developer for the entire roadway may um, be more difficult. So one thing we could possibly consider would be asking the applicant to look at their site plan to see if there was a possibility for creating future connectivity if that street were to get negotiated with the private parties and got through the normal processes. And, and I think that we would have to... I think that we would have to think about what sort of connectivity we're looking at. If it would be this develop... If there was something that TSU would want to construct or um, someone else on their property to provide for broader connectivity goals within the community, thinking about what the connection to this development would look like. Um, if it's this development providing access easement to cross drives, that's one thing that might be easier with the current plan. If it's a public road through this development, that is a more extensive change and requires revisions to this plan as a whole. So if it's an access easement, it's um, probably an easier conversation than if it's a public roadway, okay. which would require a redesign. Well, and given that this, yeah, I mean, this backs up to a railroad, so it's not exactly like there's going to be a whole lot of connectivity other than these several, I mean, TSU and the project. Okay, that's helpful. And I guess, I mean, the, the list of um, traffic conditions is long. In fact, I was surprised to see that the requirement for the traffic signal is all the way down in Jefferson and 40. So that's like two or three blocks from the project. Okay, that's right. Um, I mean, it seems to me that the developer is taking on a lot of improvements um, to try to make this project work. I think um, the density makes sense. Um, I think this is a really good use for this part of the community with the access to TSU and, um, you know, given the challenges that we have right now in Nashville with securing more affordable housing, in good locations, access to transit, and the rest. Um, I support staff's recommendation. Commissioner Tibbs? Yeah, I don't have a whole lot more to add because the community is actually for the development. It's just the access. I, you know, I do echo, I understand the complications that would need to be done um, with TSU and with MDHA, and, and I won't act as an expert, but I know if it's TSU, it could be state land as well that has to be brought into it if it's as far as an easement is concerned. Um, I don't know if there's any um, options by the councilman or anybody that they've they've spoken to or they would be interested in more, from, you know, more time to talk to those other public entities at all. Uh, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all. I mean, that would be the only avenue they would do, and then they'd probably have to be a little bit of a partnership, potentially, where they are willing to maybe um, 
build a road. I don't know about that part. Right. Yeah, so there, there has been two letters that were received from the applicant today from Tennessee State and from MDHA to um, offer the easements, uh, but with more conversation. Um, if we receive them today, there, there's not, you know, when we, when we speak of plans or, or anything of that nature, we haven't had a chance to do that. But um, I think there will have to be more conversation with uh, the stakeholders to move forward with, with any development of a, of a roadway. Um, so, yeah, it's, it seems like unless there's something else we could do, there's, we, there's not much else the developer can do at this point unless that is, you know, that's correct. Other, otherwise, it seems like a great development. Thank you, Councilman. Council Lady. Thank you. Um, so I have a few questions. I, I have a lot of concerns about that it appears a letter has come out today, the day of planning, which is always gives me a little hesitation, um, from a state university, because they do not move very quickly at all, um, nor does MDHA. So, I mean, y'all may have had that in the works for a while, but it is, it is concerning, and also that it's not a set in stone easement, it sounds like. It's an offering of an easement. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. I'm also wondering, so you, you've got a bus stop labeled on here, and I do like the clarification that that would just be a school bus stop. Um, my concern, it might be better for the community that the bus stop is not internal to your, um, have you talked to MMPS about internal bus stops to apartments rather than putting it maybe on the edge of your property where it would serve more than just your tenants, that it would serve the greater community? And also I'd like to hear about, you have a greenway marked on here, but what communications have you had with parks and greenways or Nashville greenways? So if, if the applicant can speak to you, if they've had any communication with parks and greenways, any communication with MMPS, and then um, shoring up something more than maybe there could possibly, we can talk about a potential easement and roadway. Uh, sure, um, I'll let Scott speak about um, the greenway, but about the first two, the bus stop, we have had communication with um, National Public Schools, the intent is that it is a benefit for residents with 288 units of affordable housing. The majority of our, um, it's one, two, and three bedroom uh, units which are in, in very high demand here and most of our, um, most of our uh, population and residents is typically single head of household with children and so there'll be a significant amount of, of children here that we're serving. So that was the intent. What uh, Nashville Public Schools had said in our brief conversations was, when this development opens in 2022, potentially, they do a routing um, closer to that time, depending on the specific enrollment, but that it would be possible for a school bus to come in and pick um, children up. So I think we're open to a different placement on the site, if that makes sense, in concert with Nashville Public Schools um, about that item. About the timing of, of the letters, uh, with MDHA, we have partnered with them through their um, payment in lieu of taxes financing program to support the construction of the affordable housing. Um, so we have contacts there and have been working with them over several months to secure even a letter like this saying they're willing to, to uh, open uh, up and consider easements. Similarly with TSU, we actually had help um, from uh, the community who had contacts with TSU in order to get a meeting with President Glover uh, and her chief of staff, which took uh, quite a bit of coordination um, al alone to get that. So uh, over the last several months, we've we happened to secure those letters this morning. Um, and I, just as one last final piece, I think on the timing of it, um, I don't think that TS personally the TSU and MDHA can commit to much more than we're willing to work with you and provide easements because they like they themselves have to program what TSU space needs, what they need to build out, what access and their property development um, plans are for their land as well as MDHA. And so um, for them to commit anything more than that over the short time frame relatively um, <coughs> that we've been working on on the project, I think that is uh, something that takes more time and study. And I, I would like to add to that, the, uh, the genesis of the letters were based on a, the community meeting over a week ago. Um, we committed to continuing working with the community and the council member on the potential road connection. Um, they stated to get their support, they would prefer to have letters of agreement from TSU and MDHA. So 
Uh, those letters have been provided today, uh, which is six days after our last meeting. So I, I think in, the, in that context, it was a pretty quick turnaround for those two agencies um, to, to provide that. And, and that was something we committed to pursuing uh, based at the input from the last meeting. Uh, so we're, we're in, committed to continuing those conversations. And you know the engineering and alignment and future planning for those properties is gonna take significant time. And, and we're willing and able to be engaged throughout their processes to stay an active uh, participant uh, and partner in those efforts. Related to the Greenway, um, the Greenway we provided and allocated for the necessary easements in the future and we'll be in direct coordination with Greenways uh, for engineering details as we continue on in design development uh, to construct our portion. Our understanding of the proposed Greenway is it's part of a long range plan uh, to connect to a greater network um, that's gonna take many, many years, um, but we're able to uh, secure a large piece of that uh, within our own property. I'm just concerned that um, it does take a long time. We Greenways do take a long time to build a, and connect and things like that. And my concern is is that you have it on here that it is that it will be a greenway. That you have the easements. That you, you just mentioned that you'll be building part of it, but if this Greenway does not get funded by Metro for 15 years, in 15 years, I know you said you're a long time uh, property holder of 20 years and plus like that, but you know, 35 years or something, where is the community left with holding that? And maybe that is something that it, it's better used if if you were building your part now um, or, or putting that investment into Greenways for Nashville or something or pre-building some of it. And I know that's a condition <laughs> that we have done here before. Um, but I, what I am hearing a lot of tonight too is that there's more time. It's gonna take more time. I know there is time before this gets to council. I don't know if um, if a meeting deferral will, what that does to the public hearing and introduction at council. If we deferred this one meeting, if that changes that public hearing schedule or if it moves the public hearing back. There's no bill. Okay, so there hasn't been anything filed. If I could so. add, just to clarify, uh, Councilman Lady, um, the we we plan our intent is to build the, the Greenway as part of our development. So you would build it now. Correct. Okay. Okay, that makes me feel better. Yeah, and, um, and I mean, as far as delaying uh, the application, obviously we've we've uh, delayed for to coordinate this roadway effort, and I mean um, we're obviously always willing to continue conversations with the community, but. Um, a one meeting deferral, you know, wouldn't get us uh, any further advance with TSU and MDHA that than uh, we would need to be. We probably need a significant amount of time, you know, upwards to a year to guarantee the final design for that effort. Okay. Well, I think um, with that being said, the councilman always has the opportunity to handle uh, a time delay if needed or or whatnot at council. So I feel comfortable letting Councilman uh, Taylor work that out. Um, and with that, um, I think there's still a lot to be worked out before it gets to council. And I hope to see that before we discuss this again. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, all the uh, questions and answers. And I do also think this is a great uh, design. And I'm uh, pleased to hear community is majority embracing uh, this change. And it sounds like more community and uh, development team engaged, uh, better product will come up. So uh, as far as concept and as far as uh, presented to front of us, uh, I can support. Uh, however, I would like, uh, you know, leading with the council member and uh, development team, continue engagement with MDHA and TSU to secure future connectivity and design. And we are not going to, you know, put that as a condition to constrain your ability to secure uh, finance. Uh, but uh, that's, I would like to keep continue working with our council member and community to make it happen. Commissioner Gamble. <clears throat> uh, I, I agree. I think we've got a good design. I think it's a good project. It's got good thought. <clears throat> it does have a lot of uh, things that will help traffic in the area. Uh, and I 
think that getting a, a, an agreement on a layout of another access with MDHA and TSU to say that could be done in a year is very optimistic. Uh, I think that would be a long-term plan that would have to relate to their overall plans for uses of those properties. And in many cases, they haven't gotten to even begin that process. So I think what's submitted is, is I support what's submitted. Mr. Sims. I've got a lot of stuff kind of rattling around in my head. First of all, going back to your caution that we not worry about anything but land use when we're pretty absorbed in the financial problems that you've got. So I'm trying to back up and go just in terms of land use, what's our responsibility here? And I want to thank you, Scott, and also Mr. Meyer. You know, I respect so much both of you trying very hard to model for us what it looks like to really sit around this table and try to figure this out together. I have a safety concern, and that's only because my son lives in California, and he only had two exits out, and they were both blocked during the fire. And having one street with two exits, but if that street gets blocked, how do people get out of there? And so I'm a little concerned about just having access to for neighbors. I think first, before the developer answers, um, that the question would be, did the fire marshal approve the project, and if they've had... Well, I know, but I also want to ask but yeah, a but safety we, question. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. That's very appropriate. But let's have staff talk about the fire marshal piece. That, that's right. The fire marshal um, has approved, and uh, typically with um, multifamily developments, there's a certain uh, unit threshold wherein they have to have an actual second access, and I don't even I don't believe that they are there at that access at that um, threshold. And so um, it has been approved by all reviewing agencies of Metro, um, and, and also against the life safety code. Thank you. Uh, developer that is accurate um, we do have the we meet the fire the international fire code uh, requirement for number of points of access for emergency access and widths of those fire access lanes as well as the aerial apparatus access right. requirements of the fire code and so um, uh, as far as where they go if they're both blocked I, I suppose you know that's that's a harder question to answer but um, we do meet all the the code requirements for fire access. And I think I raised that question only because one of the options you I think that Lisa actually raised was about maybe having some kind of other street access, not necessarily this road. And I did go look at this piece of property and walk that entire road, and there's actually a road back there. I mean, it already is a road, but um, I am concerned that there be some type of access simply because the neighborhoods are so united around that, and that's something they requested and something you you said. and. I'm also trying to take very seriously what our chair asked us to do, which was not worry about the money and all that, just land use. So I'm trying to figure out how we do that. I think I would be willing to accept it. I love this. Of course, I love y'all's work. You do incredible work with affordable housing in our city, and we need it desperately. I would just like to see us do something about another access. So, Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Haynes. So I think it's ideal that you get an access point. I think it's impractical. Uh, not only do you have to get TSU support, you got to get the Board of Regents. I've tried to do that in the past. I think a year is very optimistic. I think it'll take multiple years. Um, you know, Commissioner Farr has preached for years about more and more affordable housing. This is a plan that's all affordable housing. It's fronting the streets. This is incredibly thoughtful. Uh, I don't think a deferral makes any sense. The only condition I would love to add is to make sure that the Greenway is built to Greenway standards. Um, and we get that feedback from Amy and her team, and then we build it right the first time. So Tennessee State does not have a board of regents anymore. It's a, a, a board of governance. But well, I, I think ultimately because it's a state university, the board of regents has to approve everything. No. Came out from under the board. Okay, that's just all right. They just changed. It. But, Nevertheless, yeah. um, I don't think an access point is mandatory at this point in time. So I would move approval of staff's recommendation. With right. that. With, it. With the condition that the Greenway be built to Greenway specifications. There's a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Ayes have it. We appreciate y'all coming down. And we're, sh we're going at a good clip, so we probably, if it's okay with the commissioners, to continue. Is everybody comfortable with that? So, <laughs> let's, uh, so we are now on to, <coughs> if, uh, if everybody could quickly 
We've got a lot of business tonight, so if everybody could quickly exit, if you're appreciate you coming, Councilman. Yeah. All right, we're on item 11. Well, before we start, uh, hold on one second. Hold on, we're gonna take just a quick brief, not break, but just give me one minute. Make sure, <laughs> give us a minute. Yeah, we, we could, um, so y'all, uh, commissioners, we, Items 11, 12, and 13 are probably going to be uh, a lot of testimony. Uh, history has, uh, <laughs> empirical evidence has proven that, that um, these particular items, there's a lot of testimony on both sides. So what we, what we could do is suspend the rules and, and allow these to be put on the heel of our calendar if you want to, because I know there's a lot of citizens here that um, may not be here for the short-term rentals and that they're real projects. Those are text. Here, let's, you get a, if you would, Vice Chair. If, I think uh, since we have three of them together, that's going to take quite some time. And some of the ones that are later in the agenda maybe are, we can get through more quickly. And so I think that would be fair to the people that are here to try to. No. Well, Seriously, uh, so here's the deal. We're respectful to everyone and everyone respectful to us. There are specific projects uh, for particular citizens. These are text changes uh, to the code, which are a completely different animal within the code. And so it's really up to the commissioners. Um, I appreciate uh, your thoughts and the booing, but um, <laughs> We generally are, try to be professional and respectful, and so we don't want to, I don't have to kick anybody out of here, which we've done before. Um, so it, it's, it's just a thought. I, I don't want to lead that discussion because we publish this in certain order, obviously, and so that is a condition of, of uh, the public also. Uh, expecting so, Commissioner. Let me just ask a question after 11, 12, 13. Oh, you speak. Oh, excuse me. After 11, 12, 13, what are the ones that would be? Is so that we 19? have 19, which is a here. Let's look at these. Which one? And the one that was pulled off. This is the Old Hickory Retreat Cottages. 20. Hold on, Councilman. May I consult with you first? Or yeah. Hold on one second. So, forgive me. So while you, well, the commission began to entertain a discussion about STRs. Um, it's my understanding that Council Lady Vircher um, and Councilman Hager um, would like to speak on their items that may change the list that you're about to read, possibly. So, Chairman, I don't mean to make things more complicated, no, no, that's but very, how that's would very you helpful. like to, <laughs> before so, we read off what we're going to hear, perhaps, oh, okay. Okay, all right, oh, excellent, okay. Um, three council members here um, to, I to think, talk about the agenda. Uh, I think that would be great if the commissioners are willing to hear the council members, I would like to hear what they have to say. And just because I think that there's we always a them. lot of folks in the hallway that you're not seeing that are not in the room as well. So, Councilman Hager, you wanna go first so the commissioners can, or Councilor Virtue, you wanna go first? I'll go real quick. Okay. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not staying Councilman for Hager, you're recognized. I'm not staying for the STRs. I've paid my dues on that. <laughs> <laughs> I had 19, had one gentleman objecting to it. I don't know if he's still here or not. I think he left. But uh, somebody wanted an explanation about this particular project. 
these were some houses that were dilapidated that belonged to Temple Baptist. They were falling down completely. And that's what, th when this was bought, that was the plan to put this density in there. It's an SP. The houses are going to run 260 to 300,000 apiece. Be no STRs. Uh, they're going to have partially brick and hardy backer. And it's going to be a nice addition to the Lakewood area. And I'm asking that it be put back on consent. All right, and so let's make sure is, uh, thank you, Councilman, that's, that's great. Uh, is anyone here on item 19 that objects to putting it back onto the consent? <coughs> I wanna make sure, is there anyone out in the hallway we all check? We had, to de we had the developer talk to this gentleman and he showed him pictures of the houses and the okay. plan, and we took in two lots completely out of this before we came and got it back to the planning commission. Thank you, Councilman. Let's just make sure I want, I want to, we want to be as fair as possible to everyone. So there are no other objections. So, commissioners, is there a motion to put this back on consent? There's second. proper motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Seeing no other discussion, say. <laughs> All those in favor, say aye. <laughs> no, ayes have it. Okay. That's uh, item 19 is put on back onto the consent. Thank, Thank you. And then we have Councilor Virtue. Welcome. Good afternoon, uh, Chair and Commissioners. I am Councilwoman Taneka Vircher representing District 28. I am speaking on Agenda Item 18, 2020 SP-003-001, um, the Eagle Point. That is a request to rezone from SP to SP zoning for property located at 2158 Unit Antioch Pike. Um, I believe this agenda item was also on consent and was already deferred um, to February 13, 2020. My ask is that uh, we defer um, this agenda item to the second meeting um, in March. This will allow me time to have a community meeting. The notices um, went out over the holidays, so a lot of neighbors um, want to wear. And um, additionally, uh, some discrepant information um, went out to to the neighbors as it relates to to the development. So if we can if we can defer to the second meeting uh, in March, where we can uh, work together and clarify some of that discrepant information that went out to the neighbors. Thank you, Councilor. I don't know how I'll do that, being that you've already has been deferred. Well, what we'll do is, uh, w without objection, we'll reconsider our action on um, item 18. <laughs> You'll move that we okay. reconsider our action? We reconsider our action. On item 18. Item 18, and then do I need another motion? No, no, you you got to speak into the microphone. Yeah. I will move to reconsider our action on item 18, and then I can make my next motion, too. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any other discussion? Seeing no other discussion, all in favor of uh, reconsidering our action on item 18, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. We're on item 18. And, and is there I'd a motion? like to make a motion to move that to the second meeting in March. Based on the council lady and the developer. Yes. Right. Thank you, council lady. Thank you so much. And so that's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. Oh, I'm sorry, you didn't vote. All in okay. <laughs> seeing no other discussion, all in favor, say aye. 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 Those no eyes have it, and then item 18 is deferred to the second meeting. Thank you so much. In March. All right, and Council A. Bendig. All right, we're just taking everybody in line, and we appreciate y'all um, helping us get through this really busy calendar. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, so I am looking at item 30. As I understand, it was pulled from consent. Yes, ma'am. And I want to make sure that um, this is something that uh, we've had no concerns from the neighbors. There is a property. Let me back up. The staff recommendation was to approve this. Um, the next door neighbor has a very similar property that was grandfathered in. I see no reason not to approve this. So this does have my support, and I would ask for your approval. All right, and so we, that I believe was Commissioner Johnson that yes. uh, asked it to be pulled. And so, um, uh, Commissioner, are you okay with putting it back on consent? Have you 
have, has it addressed your, yes, your question? Yes, I... Uh, Do you have questions yes, for the Yes, I had a question. Uh, it was a policy question because it is although T4, but neighborhood maintenance. And yes, I understand the next door neighbor has a uh, duplex, a uh, grandfather in. But all surrounding uh, resident are currently uh, zoned uh, RS. So it's, of course, you know, one parcel can trigger, and because one next door has already grandfathered in, an entire area can move forward to zoning. So it seems to me that's a seems like a trigger point rather than neighborhood maintenance policy. So that's at a policy discussion, interpretation, uh, philosophy difference. Uh, maybe Lisa can. Sure. Shed some light onto this. Side. Sure. Um, so, in neighborhood maintenance areas, we of course don't look at every property the same way across all neighborhood maintenance areas. We look at each individual property on its own merit. And there's part of the neighborhood maintenance policy also that talks about not encouraging double frontage lots, kind of the creation of double frontage lots. In this entire neighborhood, we kind of have this one unique part of a block that already has existing double frontage lots. And what that does is create, um, <laughs> sorry, what that does is create sort of an unusual development pattern that is not one that we encourage. And so by rezoning, we're actually able to create a more urban <coughs> development pattern because you have the opportunity to have a unit fronting each of the two streets that already exist. And so these are uniquely situated and it's not, it's unlikely that there are a lot of other areas within this neighborhood that we would actually find to be appropriate. But because it's already in a, a lot layout that's not one that's supported by the policy, this is actually moving it closer to the goals of the policy by allowing both streets to be fronted. I appreciate that. I figure, you know, looking at, uh, that stretch of the street, and so it was really uniquely different. So I, I was assuming once we started rezoning that particular parcel, that would encourage you know rest of the four or five parcel to you know follow the lead uh, in the future. So if that's the intent, you know, in this particular uniquely different neighborhood, I'm okay with supporting it. But I just wanted to have those policy discussion. And for that, uh, if other commissioners are okay, I'm uh, inclined to put that on the uh, consent agenda. Councilor, and you would like, you're requesting to put it back on the consent agenda, is that, that correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, so there's been a request by the council lady and uh, the commissioner is okay. Is there a motion to do, to put item 30 back on the consent? That's a proper motion, is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 There's no item 30 is passed on the uh, consent agenda. Now, thank you. We have, thank you, Council. I really appreciate you coming in. So the, we're handling these items quickly. Okay. So item 22, uh, Bob tells us that uh, the opposition for item 22, which was on the consent agenda originally, is not here, so let's, uh, has- He is here, it's, it's, it's But has agreed. But has agreed, he's here, but has agreed, it's okay. All right, Mr. Stern is shaking. <laughs> I see him shaking his head, yes. There's policy ramification, here. but this- Come stay, say that on the microphone. Mr. Stern, rolling Stern. With I'm rolling Stern. with it. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, John Stern, representing Cane Ridge Community Trust. Uh, we're talking uh, the this agenda item number 22 uh, is dealing with a 399 acre planned unit development that was created in 1984. Uh, some of these, some, some folks weren't alive back then and many of our planners uh, hadn't gotten out of uh, high school yet. <laughs> so it's difficult to get information about plans that are that old and it's difficult for citizens to actually engage with planners and with developers when we don't know what's going on. 
we got, we, we received notification, as we do uh, always, Monday about a, a, an agenda item today. So we had Monday night, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and we were unable to uh, get the data, get the information, and meet with people uh, to resolve that. So uh, there'll be some further communications, hopefully generating some ideas that we might think about doing to make this a little easier. Thank you, but you're okay with putting uh, item 22 back on the consent agenda? Yes, we Thank you. hope that the commission reevaluates this particular develop the 399 acres, but this request Thank you. Doesn't seem like we have. Appreciate it. Any, are there, let's make sure, is there anyone in the audience objecting to item 22? We want to make sure that there's no one else. All right. Seeing none, commissioners, it, we, I, we, I could entertain, we can entertain a motion to put item 22 back. So in moved. So second. motion is second. Any other discussions? I guess just is there some yeah. discussion that we need to have at a future date around this? I don't know. I, I mean, is there something there that we that it's a very large PUD, and so we do PUD revisions periodically. But I right. think to the uh, Mr. Stern's comments, they're they're complex. You're pulling a lot of information together. We we can do that. I I, I wouldn't. The commission doesn't need to encourage us to do that. Okay. We we. Um, but this is a revision, um, and so Lisa, if you want to just put for the record what that what that is, we're operating within existing entitlements and working within the framework that council approved, basically. Certainly. So this um, this overall PUD approved um, a lot of residential units and a lot of square footage of commercial, kind of on the southern end. Um, this was most recently actually seen by the Planning Commission in February of 2019. Um, that approved a plan for this particular site. Um, what they are doing now is just simply moving some buildings around, um, moving some parking, um, but no major changes from the plan that you all saw previously. And so it is within the council approved plan, it is considered a minor change, um, but the process does require that a revision is reviewed by the planning commission. Any other questions? All right, so there's a motion to put item 22 back on the consent agenda, and there was a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Item 22 is, is passed and put back onto the consent agenda. And so, hold on one second. We might get Lisa t or the staff to confirm that what we're listening to now is 11, 12, 13, and then item 33. And so I think going back to the chairman's question, do we want to, um, I don't want to speak for you, to consider the order given the items? Um, Did that make sense? So item 33 was on the consent agenda and so to be fair what how about the and i know we're kind of freestyling tonight a little bit council parliamentary may have requested. uh councilor murphy you requested that to be i did i received some calls um from constituents late this afternoon about stormwater concerns and this um property and so that is something that i am willing to deal with between here and the and the council hearing with the council member Okay, but there, I think there's some other, oh, there's folks other people here okay. on item 33. Is that correct? Raise your, yeah, there's some, yeah, there's folks here. Okay. okay. Then I'll uh, take that back. Uh, <laughs> so, so we generally don't go out of order, or I'd, I'd highly discourage us, you know, going out of order because this is the published um, agenda and it has to be a really good reason, or, and I know there's, how many folks are here on item 33? How many? There's like four or five. Yeah, there's there's several. So we can consider that item right now uh, and get through that, but there are a lot of other people waiting. Just this is a discussion amongst the commissioners. It's not my decision. Uh, it's it's our decision. So um, we, we could suspend the rules and, and place uh, – but probably I would encourage us to probably stay – uh, on the published calendar. 
it's just one now, and so there's not as many people here. Uh, is that, do I feel like that's, is that everybody's agreement to stick I with the commissioner? I will uh, suspend the rule, and because short-term rental is our longest discussion, and everybody's concerned either side. So I would like to have at most uh, attention to that uh, items 11, 12, 13. For that, I would like uh, kind of bump up 33 and then discuss, and then we take a short break and then focus on 11, 12, 13. So that would be that's my a, motion. That's a proper motion to spin the rules, and there's a second. Any other discussion to consider item 33 first or next, and then items 11, 12, and 13. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, so we're going to consider item 33. We continue our freestyle tonight. <laughs> uh, so I, the um, developer is willing to defer item 33. Lisa, how, how many meetings? One or how many? One meeting. So the developer is willing to defer uh, one meeting, but he's going to talk to the residents. And Would the residents be okay with it? I just want to make sure, I mean, because it would probably be a good thing, probably, actually, to defer one meeting. <clears throat> okay, so uh, thank you, ma'am, but... Uh, okay, wait, 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 we are getting way out of control. So uh, the developer is willing to um, defer one meeting, uh, and I think that it sounds like a lot of communication needs to happen between that time. So two, meet, two meetings would probably help that. Thank you, Mr. Dale, I appreciate that. Um, and then hopefully uh, the developer will talk to the neighbors and, and then come back. Okay, so on, we are on item 33. Developers- I will make motion to reconsider item uh, number 33 to defer to uh, first meeting in March. Well, the proper motion is just a deferral defer. motion, not a reconsideration, because we're on the item. So the motion would be two meeting, defer. deferral. So it'd be the second meeting second in February. Meeting February. Yes. Okay, that's the mo proper motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor, say aye of the aye. deferral. Aye. aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it. And we are. So um, we. It's five forty-seven. We have three more items. We know these items are going to take a long time. Would the commission like to continue to try to get through one of these items and then take a break? I think that might be smart. Okay. All right. So. Thank you. Yeah, we'll try to get through item 11 and then a five-minute restroom break. Five restroom break. So we do. We've been here about two hours. Uh, we have some commissioners that uh, need to take a quick five-minute break. We're going to take a quick break. We're not going to. It's not a long one, and then we'll try to get through one more and then take a longer break. Okay, quick five-minute break. Uh, have left uh, three items for public hearing, which is items 11, 12, and 13, and we are going to take these in order. So item 11. Um, item number 11 is a proposed text amendment, and this proposal would amend section 17.16.070 of the Metropolitan Zoning Code related to short-term rental properties not owner-occupied. Uh, this amendment would prohibit units that are less than 100 feet from a religious institution, a school, a park, or a daycare. Um, there is an exemption written in, permitted, with a, a public hearing and council approval. Um, existing permits would not be affected. Uh, that's consistent with both state and local laws. 
Uh, just a bit of a history on where uh, we have been as a metro government on short-term rental permits. Um, back in January of 2018, the council adopted BL 2017-608, which was the countywide framework regarding the regulation of short-term rentals within Davidson County. That created two categories of short-term rental properties, owner-occupied and not owner-occupied. It also established the operational criteria for those uh, uses and established the zoning districts in which both of those types of short-term rentals would be permitted. Following adoption of BL 2017-608, the state of Tennessee adopted the Short-Term Rental Act. Um, that kind of established how municipalities could or could not regulate the operation of short-term rentals. August of 2019, the Metro Council adopted 2019-1633. This was a further refinement of the rules and regulations regarding short-term rentals. Um, it removed not owner-occupied short-term rentals as being permitted within the SP, I'm sorry, within the RM districts. What that did was bring consistency to the residential only districts, the R, the RS, and the RM, to treat not owner-occupied units the same way within those districts. Um, it also further refined the standards, um, operational standards, consistent with the state-adopted Short-Term Rental Act. Uh, the proposal would, um, I'm sorry, staff recommends approval of the amendment with a substitute. The substitute would further refine how distance is measured. As currently proposed, the amendment indicates different measurements based on the different uses uh, which the not owner occupied would have to be located away from. For instance, it would be building to building in some cases. In some cases, it would be building to lot line. In some cases, it would be building to a playground. Um, in order to ease enforcement um, and make the permitting process more streamlined, it would be a substitute that would refine that distance is measured from lot line to lot line of those particular uses. Uh, this would also allow for the use of digital mapping as a measurement tool at the time of application, um, making the ease of the application um, uh, more streamlined. Um, staff recognizes that this is a continuation of the refinement of the operational criteria, and as such, it is one that the Metro Council um, should be the primary determiner on. Um, but we do recommend an approval with a substitute to further refine how the measurements are made for ease of enforcement. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, we'll open this item for public hearing, and the applicant is actually the on this particular item is actually uh, the councilman, Councilman Sledge, he already spoke. I don't think the councilman's here. We just want to make sure that he's not here with, with Arthur. Uh, <laughs> and so um, we will start right into the uh, discussion. And so is there one, anyone in the room wishing to speak in support? All right, come on up, start to line up. And uh, we appreciate everybody coming down and you guys know the drill. You got two minutes, and please state your name and address for the record. Thank you. Hi, my name is Omid Yamini. I still live at 1204 North 2nd Street, Nashville, Tennessee, 37207. Uh, I'm here as a resident of Nashville uh, to speak in support of this bill. I think uh, Councilman Sledge has been around and knows the STR uh, situation pretty thoroughly in his district, so I trust his judgment in this uh, bill. And, um, you know, I'm going to take a, a second of my time to just say that, you know, it's it's no, no mystery that we're going to be vastly outnumbered here tonight. Um, but I would like to just remind you that, you know, neighborhood advocates are not being paid. We're not making money off STRs. So, you know, for every one of us, probably counts for about 50 of people that are here because they're making money off this stuff. Again, I'd like to speak in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. And let me remind everyone, since there's so um, many people here to discuss things, and we remind everybody, please try not to repeat yourselves, try to have clear arguments, and we really do appreciate everybody coming down. So thank you. Good evening. I'm Pat Williams. I live at 4301 Elkins Avenue. And item 11 will increase the safety of children attending local schools, daycares, parks, and churches. Please support it. Thank you. Next. 
I think I'm Logan Key at 1411 Fatherland Street uh, in East Nashville. I'm also vice chair of the Coalition for Nashville Neighborhoods. Uh, the crux of this of this ordinance is about uh, one-off community participation uh, in the event uh, that a, that a uh, non-owner occupant wishes to get a vacation rental permit, and and that is a critical piece of this that I think was missing in the original ordinance, uh, and I think we've not got that piece right yet. And so as you as you have your deliberations, keep in mind that this is this is not about trying to harm anyone. This is not about trying to restrict anyone. This is about community participation. And that's what planning and zoning is all about. And so I would urge you to take that particular concept into consideration during discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm John Summers, 5000 Wyoming Avenue. I'm here on behalf of the Coalition for National Neighborhoods. We have about um, 65, 66 neighborhoods represented in our coalition. Um, I'll be brief. This is a very minor uh, change, but I think it's not an insignificant change because I think this government has always recognized that we need to have special protections for churches, schools, daycares, and things like that. I actually sponsored the, the beer pud ordinance to maintain that we have some protections and we have a process within which you can go through, and this does provide that. Real quickly, and I'm not going to take too much time because we've been here, several of us, a long time on this issue. Um, again, what you're seeing is, is that when this was presented to this, uh, to this commission and to this council, and in many, many, many cities across the country, this was presented as a, well, this is just the homeowner renting out a room or two. And what we didn't realize at the time, because it was all so new, is that this really was a Trojan horse. And you're gonna hear from a lot of people tonight that some of them may rent out a room in their home, but the majority of them rent out these as businesses. And so I would urge this commission, both on this bill and the other two, which I'll speak also briefly on, is that whatever we can do, these council members are trying to tweak this, to try to respond to their constituents, to try to uh, protect the community as a whole. And, uh, and, and again, I appreciate the staff's recommendation in support of this and working with it. And, uh, and I would urge you to support this because I think it's a pretty minor step forward um, but thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you, I'll, sir. I'll be back. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Anyone else? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Welcome. And if everybody would try to line up so we can keep, keep it rolling, appreciate you coming down. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Planning Commission. My name is Dale Heyer, and I live at 4425 uh, four, Cecil Court, uh, Nashville 37207. And I uh, respectfully request five minutes as I'm speaking on behalf of an organization, the Nashville Area Short-Term Rental Association. Uh, thank you so much for your service to our community and taking the time to listen to us once again. I'm here tonight on behalf of the Nashville Area Short-Term Rental Association, our over 250 members, and myself, a born and raised Nashvilleian, your neighbor, and a responsible host. We would like to share our opposition to the three newly proposed short-term rental bills, BL 2019-78-79 and-111, and ask that you vote no on these three bills. Based on constructive feedback, our organization has received about the negativity and length associated with these hearings. We'll do our best to keep our points concise and respect your time while still letting our voices be heard and exercising our right to publicly voice opposition. In an effort to best demonstrate this, we've asked those in opposition to these bills to wear blue, and many of them have on these stickers tonight. And at this time, I would like to ask those in the audience who are opposed to these three bills to quietly raise your hands now. On behalf of our members and as advocates of the host community, we'd like to share our top concerns about each bill. Uh, bill 2019-111. We understand and support the need for a high density affordable housing. However, there are alternatives to creating a new, an entirely new layer of zoning specifically targeting short-term rentals. One example would be to provide builder incentives to, to affordable housing much like the city has done in the past to provide incentives for hotels to build here. This bill does not address affordable housing. Instead, it opens the door for properties, streets, and neighborhoods to be rezoned to eliminate one specific use, short-term rentals. If this passes, it is easily foreseeable that any council member or Nashville citizen could be able to apply for a downzoning of our homes or streets. This is grievously concerning on many levels. Secondly, 
Bill 2019-79. This bill was introduced by its sponsor as a solution to quote party homes. We recognize that there are problems with homes that need to be addressed. However, as the data shows that 99.8% of all call calls to codes and police are not tied to permitted short-term rentals. Let's work together to identify a solution that would better support our codes department on enforcement of bad actors. For starters, prioritizing regulation enforcement against the 1,200 plus short-term rentals operating illegally would result in a nearly 20% drop in the number of homes being rented in Nashville. This is a far more effective solution to quote party homes than another new bill that would likely remain unenforced against the true bad actors. When lawfully permitting hosts rent out their homes, or excuse me, their basements, DADUs, DADUs, or portions of their primary home that have a separate entrance to the guest space, these are listed as whole home options on the short-term rental platform, as the guest rental area is completely private. Banning whole home rentals will flag these legitimate owner-occupied scenarios, which are in fact lawful. It would limit those who rent their whole homes while traveling, which includes musicians, educators, medical professionals, military, and so many more. For many people, this would, this would impact their ability to afford keeping their home here in Nashville. And thirdly, BL 2019-78. The sponsor of this bill referred to comments made at public hearings about the nature of activity happening at non-owner occupied short-term rentals. However, at those same hearings, there were often an, as many or more people there sharing stories of, the, of a complete opposite nature. A large majority of short-term rentals are self-monitored with security cameras, noise monitoring software, and more. And this contributes to the fact that while short-term rentals make up 1.8% of the housing in Davidson County, they only represent 0.2% of the complaints to codes and the police. The data has continually shown that there are actually less issues tied to short-term rentals than other types of housing in Davidson County. For this reason, we feel that the 100-foot rule is completely unnecessary. While I, would certainly, while I could certainly share many more reasons that these bills should not pass, these are the main ones, and I'll leave it to those behind me to share more if they so desire. In closing, I'd like to remind you that while we are hosts, we are two Nashvillians, and we are two your neighbors. We respectfully ask that you vote no on Bills 111, 78, and 79. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Matt Davis and I live at 5110 Michigan Avenue. I'm a lifelong Nashville resident and I'm here to speak uh, against 2019-78, the minimum distance requirement. The stated purpose of that bill is to uh, eliminate the negative secondary effects associated with the operation of non-owner occupied short-term rentals. Uh, I think in addressing this, for me personally, I looked at three different questions. Is this really a problem? Number one, does this legislation solve the problem? Number two, if there is one, and are the negative impacts of this legislation worse than the solutions? Uh, as to question number one, there's approximately 1.4 million nights per year in Nashville where people uh, occupy short-term rental homes. Uh, I looked at 363 individual complaints uh, on these homes of about 1,400 with, the, with regards to short-term rentals. Uh, of those, 20% were associated with non-owner occupied short-term rentals. So 80% were something else. Of those, so that was 72 complaints, 43 were something that could be classified as a negative secondary effect, okay? So basically, for every 100,000 nights that a guest stay in Nashville in an STRP, we get about four complaints uh, on a short-term rental, uh, a non-owner occupied short-term rental, okay? So if you still think that that's a problem, all right, two, let's see if this, this legislation solves it. Uh, of those 43 complaints, I looked at the addresses of those, three were within 100 feet of a church, school, uh, or the other criteria that we're talking about, daycare or park. So three of the 43, all right? Uh, that doesn't sound like a problem. Of those three, two were in our zoning and grandfathered in, so we've already addressed that with legislation. So those don't even count. The other one was actually investigated by codes and wiped out. It said there wasn't a violation. So I'd appreciate if you voted no on this. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. I have a, an exhibit. 
can get it to the team. Thank you. Put it, we put it on the screen, or is that, is that too much? Yeah, that's OK. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark McGinley, uh, address 1140 Brookmead Drive. Um, I'm against this bill, but I want to talk more specifically about the proposed substitution uh, regarding measurement made by staff. Um, as originally proposed, the measurement distance was 100 feet from building to building for most of the uses. Um, the new measurement from property line to property line is a significant expansion of this bill's impact. So if you're looking at the top cell of my uh, exhibit, I picked a church. Uh, the AME Bethel Church in 12 South, it's on a large lot. It's common for churches and schools with parking and, and fields and such. It's about 500 feet long, 200 feet deep. Um, and you can see the church kind of located roughly in the middle of that parcel. And the next cell is the uh, radius requirement uh, of the 100 feet from building going outwards. Uh, you can see that from the east side, no problem. Uh, west side, no problem. Doesn't it touch any neighboring properties? Uh, the south, it extends a little bit into the street, but still streets, no, no, no neighboring parcels. Going north, uh, there are five parcels affected, of which only two buildings are within that 100-foot radius. Uh, so that would be the effect, two buildings. Um, going down to the proposed me uh, measurement, you see I have to zoom out quite a bit to even fit it all in. Um, the estimated area of this is 13.9 acres of totally sterilized land for short-term rentals. Um, versus the 2.16 acres before. So it's a, it's a, it's a huge uh, expansion. You can see on the west side, 330 feet now from the, from, the, from the church. On the north, 270. On the east, 850 feet. And the reason is you measure 100 feet from that property line, that eastern property line, it just touches that, that, that parcel, and then that entire parcel gets sterilized. So is that the intent of this bill? It's a dramatic expansion. Um, and when you think about the effect of this across all of the schools and churches, um, it's, it, it ends up being quite, quite profound. So Thank you. I would ask you to not approve the proposed measurement. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Catherine Breland. Uh, my address is 3023rd Avenue South. I am here today to express my concerns with Bill BL 2019-78, which seeks to restrict non-owner occupied short-term rentals from being within 100 feet of a church, school, daycare, or park. This bill sends a terrible message to the people who choose to stay at STRs when they visit our city. Through this bill, we're telling these people that they're so noxious, so harmful to our communities that we don't want them staying within 100 feet of where children play and go to school. I feel this message is totally contrary to the way most Nashvillians feel about our guests and visitors. We should be encouraging these people to visit Nashville, not subjecting them to the same type of distance requirements typically reserved for adult shops and liquor stores. The vast majority of STR occupants are quiet and respectful during their trips to our town. This fact is proven by the incredibly low number of documented STR complaints relative to the millions of annual STR stays in Nashville. For example, in District 17, according to Metro Nashville's permit records, there are a total of 697 active rentals. Of those units, there were only 142 total complaints from January 1st in, until October 29th, which is when I obtained the records of every STR complaint that has been filed to date. Using Google Earth, I mapped the complaints in District 17 specifically and determined only five complaints were filed within 100 feet of a church, park, daycare, or school. Of the potential 150,000 annual room nights in District 17, there were only five com complaints which is equal to 0.003%. Does this constitute the development of a new bill? There is no data to support the belief that STRs located within the 100 feet of a school, church, daycare, or park have more complaints or are generally more problematic than STRs located outside of that distance. It is also worth noting that most STR complaints, specifically noise and partying, occur at night, at which time schools, churches, daycares, and parks this bill aims to protect are closed. Even if this bill were to pass, its intended beneficiaries would not be around to notice. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. My name is Mark Musser. I'm a local Nashville realtor. I'm not some guy with deep pockets or a big, with uh, you know, real estate developer. I'm just a guy that happened to invest all his money into two short-term rental properties. Um, <laughs> 
I am, uh, my first property, I've got two properties, they're both non-owner occupied. Um, one is zoned RM20, it's located at 203 Prince Avenue, and um, it's a standalone residential house. Um, it's also located within 100 feet of a church. That church is, well, I've never even seen a church service there. I, I believe it's abandoned or they're just not operating out of it, but it is located next to a church. Um, it was a tough pill for me to swallow, um, knowing that it was being zoned RM20A, that, that I would be phased out of being able to sell that house and um, somebody else would be able to acquire a um, non-owner occupied permit, but, but I'll swallow that pill. Um, the, the pill that I'm choking on is the one from uh, the newest property that I bought, which is a commercial property located at 806 Vibe Place in the Vibe development. And uh, I didn't want to be part of the Airbnb controversy or the short-term rental property con controversy, so I purchased commercial. My unit sits 50 feet from a church uh, attached to eight other units, or I'm sorry, seven other units. So, you know... I, I don't, what's going to happen if I have to move? What's going to happen if my father has another stroke and I have to go to Oklahoma City and I have to sell that property? And this law goes into effect. I won't be able to sell that property. I paid a 20% upcharge on that property to have a commercial property. I paid an extra sixty dollars to $80,000 for that property so that I could operate my Airbnb and live in peace. So <clears throat> this is devaluing my property. Nobody's going to want to buy my property if I want to sell it and be surrounded by 32 other Airbnb units. Nobody's going to want to rent my property and be surrounded by 32 other Airbnb units. So I'm a rock in a hard spot here. I ask you to vote no on this. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Leslie at 501 Union Street. I want to voice my opposition into Bill 2019-78. If you want to attack a fair and just law that prevents alcohol consumption within 100 feet of a school, church, daycare, or park, then anyone that lives within that area needs to be enticed with the same law as we are. You are singling out owners of short-term rentals just as a special class because of who we are. As it is written, the bill seems to be punitive, and I respectfully ask you to vote no on this bill. Thank you. Welcome. I am. Uh, Mark Wallace at uh, 340 Wandering Circle. Uh, I've got several properties in construction that don't have short-term rental permits yet. But uh, we've already taken precautions thinking that something like this was happening on one of them. We heard that the first bill came out. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the technical issues already. Um, uh, the, the, the notion to expand this from property to property line is um, not as hard as is what I've been explained to me, the reasoning behind it for codes examiners to be able to measure better because I've already sent surveyors out to make sure that I shot from the distance of our, our properties to the, a nearby church and we've already shifted site plans away from the church and now there is another change to make sure it's property to property line and that eliminates um, almost everything and will put us in ruin. Um, we have vested interest and we have vested statements to, uh, of showing intent what we have with these properties the the one good thing that um, has happened so far with the 1633 uh, situation was um, your committee this commission basically warned the council members to work with vested stake owners stakeholders that protect the rights of the people that have already played by the rules and bought the right bought under the right rules and let them finish out for that kind of a time frame. Um, and that helped a lot, um, regardless of whether or not this is going to pass or not, that has to at least be included as something as some of a vested for the people that have already been vested in their properties and with showed and showed intent already. So thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Welcome. I'm a, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Darren Cunningham. I represent a group of realtors and investors, and I'm a realtor and investor myself. I own short-term rental properties in Nashville, and uh, they are within 100 feet of a church, and I'll be significantly affected by this if this goes into place. I'm also in development on some of these, and I'm, I've played by the rules. I've played by the rules that were written by our city. You guys gave me the playbook, and I played by them. And now I'm being told that might change. I mentioned earlier the property value of a short-term rental property zone in a commercially zoned area 
is approximately 20 to 30 percent higher, so we have paid an upcharge for that property because you all told us that's something that we could do. And we're playing by the rules that you wrote, and they seem to be ever-changing. It's a very difficult to, to swallow that pill because now it's going to put me in a situation, along with the people I represent, in severe financial distress if this goes through. I don't think this was well thought out either. Um, you heard statistics earlier about this. Um, I don't think statistics, it seems like, were put in place and looked at and reviewed prior to this being proposed because there's no problem with the 100-foot rule. There are very, very few complaints out there, and some of them that are there, as research has shown, weren't validated. So we're talking about less than 1% of all properties out there, 0.2% have complaints filed against them that are short-term rents, compared to 1.8% of all traditional properties. So statistically, a short-term rental property is nine times less likely to have a complaint filed against it than a traditional home. These aren't, these aren't properties that are problematic, that need to have the beer laws, the strip club laws with them. I love the comment earlier about, let's welcome our visitors to Nashville. Let's not act like they are coming here to commit crimes. I hope you vote against this. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I would request five minutes as I'm speaking on behalf of the Greater Nashville Realtors. My name is Christy Hairston, and I am the 2020 president of the Greater Nashville Realtors Board of Directors. Greater Nashville Realtors is a realtor trade association with 5,300 members. I am here on behalf of our organization in regards to the latest short-term rental property discussion and speaking against items 11, 12, and 13. We request that you defer decisions and movement of these proposals until those affected in the community can give deeper thought and input. Our organization has long held the position that Nashville work on enforcement of current law regarding STRP regulation as opposed to further restrictions. The council has historically focused on non-owner occupied legislation and stayed clear of owner occupied and commercial property restrictions. Now that owner occupied property and commercial property have become part of the discussion through these proposed ordinances, our organization and members must ask that the Planning Commission and Metro Council to recognize the far-reaching effects these proposals have on property rights. We have stayed neutral on many past proposals to restrict STRPs. However, the continued reach concerns us greatly. How far will this reach continue? There seems to be no end in sight. Portions of these bills are crossing over into new restrictions on property rights of homeowners and commercial property owners that we feel go too far. We ask the commission to proceed carefully and consider the ramifications of such moves that affect commercial property and owner-occupied units and are applicable countywide. These bills are very far-reaching and continue to not address enforcement. Portions of these bills seem to take on a rare problem that is not pervasive countywide, but would affect many property owners countywide. We understand the need to regulate STRP units to some extent, but it has become almost impossible to understand and conform to the law when changes are discussed rapidly and annually. We ask the Planning Commission, as well as Metro Council, to defer any decisions or movement of these proposals until community members affected can give deeper thought and input. There continues to be fast-paced movement annually to tweak STRP regulation that is not yielding positive long-term solutions for the community. Greater Nashville Realtors would gladly take part in discussions and provide examples of how these proposals could create unintended consequences. Also, we find it concerning that a quick decision by the Planning Commission to approve these bills will result in new rules going into effect immediately under pending legislation guidelines before an in-depth discussion can take place. We very much appreciate the planning staff taking steps to recognize that item number 12 needed to be amended regarding the owner's 15-hour absence from the property. This is an example of the complexity this topic commands and how a change or in the bill to address a very rare cir circumstance could harm many property owners that are good actors with their STRP. Please defer decisions and movements of these proposals until those affected in the community can give deeper thought and input. Thank you.
Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, Commissioners. Grant Hammond, 342 Harrison Street, Nashville, Tennessee, 37201. Um, as a brief history lesson, Bill 2017-608 made short-term rental non-owner occupied a commercial use. For nearly three years, Metro Council members have called short-term rentals mini hotels. I'm gonna take a very unpopular position, I'm gonna agree. They are hotels. They are many small businesses owned by local Tennesseans operating much the same way as a hotel. We pay hotel motel tax, we have a metro collections number, we pay commercial water rates, and we have very similar traffic patterns. You know who else operates nightly rentals? Actual hotels. This bill applies to all zonings, so it would only be fair that you include actual hotels in this zoning. <laughs> hotels and non-occupied STRs both lease to the same pool of tourists who are being labeled as lewd, drunk, and noisy. If you're going to legislate tourist behavior, you must be fair and apply this law across all who lease rooms by the night. Anything less is unjust and a violation of property owner rights. This is spot zoning in a way. Out of curiosity, has council or the commission been presented with the number of complaints that were made by actual churches, schools, members of schools or churches, daycares or parks? We looked in host compliance and could not find one made by one of those institutions. Perhaps there is, perhaps it's not labeled properly, but we contend that there are very few and far in between. Is there any research on how many STRs would be affected by this 100 foot rule? We've done our own research, but we have not seen staff or council or the commission provide any type of research numbers for us, for us to crunch with you. Please defer this item until you have more information available. Thank you, go Titans. Thank you. <laughs> All right, everybody, let's not, let's try to, no clapping, no, okay. We're all under the same rules. Okay, go ahead. Hey, uh, I'm not sure how I follow that one, but um, my name is Darby Bolton and I live at 1707 Tammany Drive, 37206. Um, I'd like to voice my opinion um, about these three bills that you have up for reading. Um, planning staff's recommendation is to increase the restriction even further by measuring the 100 foot distance from lot line to lot line, rather than from, stru from structure to structure. This would impact the homes and livelihoods of even more Tennesseans. Uh, while people throw around the notion that homes and livelihoods Sorry, while people throw around the, mo the notion that short-term rentals are mostly owned by out-of-state investors, the data actually demonstrates the opposite. 80% of short-term rental permits in Nashville have been issued to Tennessee residents. Passing laws like this one hurts our own community, our own community members and citizens. Additionally, according to the latest data released, short-term rentals make up 1.8% of all housing in Davidson County, and yet they only represent 0.2% of complaint calls made to codes and to police. It's not even 1% which means that they are actually less issues, there are actually less issues of nuisance, noise, et cetera, with short-term rentals than with other types of housing, namely the one across the street from me that is a long-term rental. That only demonstrates how completely unnecessary the 100-foot rule is. Please vote no on all three of these bills. Thank you. My name is Michael Head. I live at 3428 Stokesmont Road. I'm grandfathered in, so I don't have a dog in the fight, so to speak. I'll reiterate what uh, the fellow said a couple of steps ago. If you're going to say that short-term rentals are a danger to churches, or a danger to children, based on nothing more than someone saying, oh, I'm afraid the short-term rental, you should include hotels, you should include motels. For that matter, why don't you include long-term rentals as well? Because those parties, those nasty things happen in long-term rentals as well as short-term rentals. But it, we shouldn't be singled out, or people who've invested their life savings in, in what they've invested in, shouldn't be singled out because someone has a potential fear that has no basis in fact. Thank you. Good evening. 
My name is Sean Cavanaugh. I'm a realtor. I, I lived in Nashville for several years and only recently relocated to Mount Juliet, but I uh, invested personally, professionally in the short-term rental market. I'm new to this whole process. Did the Hayman or Hyman project move forward or was that deferred from this, the first? It was to move forward? Okay, which was an important thing. It solved a lot of problems, uh, affordable housing, workforce housing, et cetera. But there are still a lot of questions around it, right? Um, from fire safety, blocking access, and um, even the regents and getting all of these other easements in place. This, based off the data I've heard from those that oppose this, I haven't seen anything that this bill is going to, or haven't heard anything that this bill is going to solve. This seems to be um, nothing there that has been um, a problem for the city or the residents. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ilya Tashinsky. I live in Franklin, Tennessee. I've been doing short-term rentals for about five years and have not had any complaints to date. I just would like to, at least to offer this, maybe if there are complaints to a specific property, you, we address it on case-by-case -case basis instead of doing these swooping rules that just affect everybody. And I also agree with the earlier point that hotels should be held to the same standard as we are. I, I don't think short-term rentals are right for every zoning. I understand if you're in a heavily family neighborhood, you don't want to live next door to a hotel. I totally get it. But I think there's a place for everything, you know. And we're making major decisions, investing a lot of money, life savings, retirement, in, you know. And then when the rules change halfway, it's very hard. Please vote now. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bob Shenerlein. I live at 1017 Southside Court. That's a neighborhood just south of the Gulch. It's about 90% um, short-term rentals. And we have very few issues. Um, I've never had a complaint. Um, I do not own any short-term rentals. I do not want to own any short-term rentals. Um, but I did want to invest in some real estate in Nashville, did my due diligence, a lot of research, purchased a property, and am currently building a duplex on that property. It borders a church. On the, on the back and on the right-hand side. Um, I have contracts to sell both of those units, and they will go through, they will die, basically. Uh, they'll be a slow death um, if this bill passes. So I played by the rules. You're moving the goalpost in the middle of the game. I'd appreciate if you consider that and uh, vote no on this. Thank you. My name is Ken Oaks. I'm a local realtor, 1412 Knox Valley Drive. I've been a local realtor in Nashville for over 37 years. Third generation, my grandfather and my father. I'm tired of coming down here. I'm tired of being persecuted. Myself and my clients are tired of being singled out. Most of my clients are retired. They depend on this income. Tired of my property rights and my client's property rights being debased and degraded. We're tired. Uh, all I've experienced is a Metro Council that continues to, to tweak and to twack. It's, it's impossible. It's very difficult to conduct business when constantly the <clears throat> rules are being changed every three, four, five, six months. It, it's, it's almost impossible. Please vote no on this. Um, otherwise, we're gonna have no choice but to look for some relief with the, with the litigation or the General Assembly. Thank you. Hi, um, thanks for the opportunity to speak. My name is Stephanie Spolstra, and my daughter Catherine is a freshman at Belmont University. Uh, she's in the nursing program. She's um, in her lab class tonight, dissecting a rat, so I'm kind of here talking on her behalf. Um, she purchased a cute little craftsman over on 
East Nashville, and it has a little dadu in the back, which she rents to people who visit Nashville. And this passive income pays for her car insurance, her food, and a great portion of her tuition. And so um, clearly her goal is to incur as little debt as she can going through college and finishing up her degree so that when she finishes, she can buy a big parcel of land and build a home and raise a family just outside Nashville where that's her goal, what she wants to do. So um, please vote no on the bills, um, BL 2019 111 to protect my daughter's education and financial future. And then the other thing, you know, like you were saying, this isn't California, this is Tennessee. So I'm totally confused. Um, why you want to take away all these permits. These are your tax dollars for our people. And where are you going to generate that kind of tax dollars taxing something else? So right now we're taxing our visitors. You're going to end up taxing us. So please say no to all three of these bills. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? We'll make sure we get everybody all right and uh, the councilman is not here so there's not going to be a rebuttal so seeing no one else wishing to speak I declare the public hearing closed Commissioner Haynes <laughs> lovely um, to the person who said he was tired I would tell you we're tired too we've, we've heard this ad nauseum for three years um, we're tired as well but we're here um, to all those people who say they paid a premium, if you're paying a premium on a one-year revocable permit, we've, I've said it before in these meetings, shame on you. You shouldn't do that. The difference between that and a hotel is they have a perpetual permit to build that hotel, to operate that hotel, and do that. One-year revocable permits, you shouldn't be paying premiums. That's your risk. I hate to say that. In this particular situation, all those with existing STRs are going to be protected. This is to prevent future STRs from being granted within, within 100 feet of these institutional structures. I think this is very well thought out on this particular item 11, and I'm going to support staff's recommendation. Commissioner Sims. And I feel exactly like Commissioner Haynes. This has been a long, and we've listened to so many people, and I have a... Um, but I think we're all tainted a lot by our own experiences. And I live in one of those neighborhoods that are now almost 90% short-term rentals. And we can't keep our schools open. We can't keep our neighborhood associations going because everybody's coming and going. There are no residents. I have trouble with this particular bill, number 11, because I come from the public policy world. And public policies at their best are to create stability. They have to be measurable. We have to know that they're really solving really important problems. And we have not been given, and I love the two people that came with data. Thank you very much. We have got to move this whole field of land use toward empirical data. And I don't know what, how big this problem is. I don't know what kind of measures we would, would be in place to ensure that we made a dent, or whether or not it's the cost of the implementation is worth the size of the problem. And so until I have more data, I would like to see this deferred. Commissioner <coughs> Gobble. Uh, I kind of agree with Commissioner Sims. I, I'm very, uh, you know, you see things like this and you start trying to administer them and all the ramifications that go along with them uh, have a, there's a lot of tentacles that go with the, each of these decisions. Um, I. You know, I think the concern I have, or the question I have, does this apply to all zoning throughout the city? It, that's correct. It would apply to, well, it would apply to zoning where not owner-occupied permits are uh, permitted because it only applies to not owner-occupied short-term rentals. So downtown, Nashville, mm -hmm. the 505 building, which is a condo building, um, <clears throat> now has a significant number of short-term rentals inside of that. If one other person in that wanted to do that, it's right across the street from a church, uh, would they be prohibited? 
That's correct. Anybody that the existing ones right. would be permitted or continue yeah, or but if allowed somebody to else, continue. If, if, if there's 125 in that building. Well, unless they would, there is an exemption provision. So they could go to the Metro Council, there could be a public hearing, and there is an allowance for an exemption. <laughs> All right. So seriously. I, so, so those hold on, the, Commissioner, hold on one second. We, we need to have a fair debate for both sides. I know there's a lot of you that are here that believe one way or another. But we can't have a good debate with lots of interruptions. And we know how you, everyone feels generally. Um, and that's why we have a public hearing. We have two other bills to go. But we're not going to laugh, clap, show your emotion. We're going to argue it professionally. OK? Because if we don't, I'll stop the hearing, and we'll defer I don't want to say we'll defer all the bills, because you would probably like that. But we'll stop the hearing and not move forward at that point until we regain control. Is that fair? Is it under? OK. All right, Commissioner. Uh, so I, I guess that's my concern, is that you know do, I don't see this being applicable to all zoning. Now, whether it's beneficial at all or not, I, I don't know that I could answer that. But if you've got a multifamily zoning and other zoning that would allow this, uh, you know, the fact that the 505 is right across the street from a church, uh, there's other developments proposed or where short-term rentals would be mostly appropriate, very appropriate. So I just, so I, again, like Commissioner Sim says, I'd kind of like to see it deferred and a little bit more thought given to it. Commissioner, Commissioner Jones. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I agree with uh, Commissioner Haynes. I think this bill is well thought out in the land use po uh, uh, point of view. I mean, good thing is, and uh, thank you for everybody coming in here and speak, and I really appreciate current short-term uh, rental permit holder because you are uh, operating under uh, the rule and the regulation and try to improve quality of life or the Nashville citizens while uh, you know, protecting your investment. I understand that and I do appreciate that. And so what this proposed bill will do is current short-term permit holder such as yours and good standing, even though non-owner occupied, it's not applicable. It's grandfathered in. So as long as your business is are in a good uh, standing, you don't lose your permit. You can continuously renew it. That's the beauty of it. And then a second point, uh, this is uh, only uh, applicable to new, non, not owner-occupied uh, short-term rental permit. Uh, so, and that is only applicable to like MUN, OG, CN, SCN. So as far as a land use policy, uh, I see in the new short-term rental, would that be appropriate for us and for community to have short-term rental and SCN uh, zoning? Or SCN use will be more uh, appropriate for that particular uh, land. I think that's the discussion we can have in that uh, uh, point. So uh, answering uh, Commissioner Goble's question, such as 505, uh, the beauty of this bill is that time, if the new resident would like to apply for the new not owner occupied short-term rental, the applicant has choice to go to a council member and then present the case to entire council and then good uh, you know, permission to uh, apply for the short-term rental. So that is a well thought out system. So that will give us a further future, really totally applicable land use policy. That will give us what will be appropriate for existing short-term rental permit holder that will not risk and endanger it. But for the future expansion, we can literally consider existing short-term rental 
uh, based zoning uh, versus you know, future short-term rental. So one thing I, I would like to ask uh, the staff is, when I was reading uh, uh, preamp preamble, it states not owner-occupied, and I believe this is only applicable to not owner-occupied, but actual uh, uh, language under D, uh, minimum distance, and then I, is start no new STR permit shall be issued. So I think that's a so, typo or no, what? So um, owner-occupied are in a different section of the code than not owner-occupied. So 1716070, which is what this changes, is only applicable okay. to not owner-occupied permits. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure there's no typo. Great. So I think so in that consideration, I, I think this uh, uh, bill is well thought out. I am comfortable uh, supporting staff recommendation. Councilor? Thank you. Um, I'm going to agree with the with the council, um, the former council lady Johnson, and with uh, with Jeff on this one. Um, I, we have heard this over the past four and a half years at council that y'all are paying a premium for these, for for your properties, and that you expect us as the government to protect your your investment. And this is not. Um, I'm going to get the acronym wrong, the banking acronym. Clearly, I'm not in banking. The FDIC, right? I mean, I would love to be able to call my stockbroker and say, I gave you this much money. You've got to guarantee me a return on this, right? So, like, we've got, you've, you've got to come to the council with something other than, or to the commission as well, with something other than, well, we, we should be make money off of this because we should. That That is getting very frustrating for the council to hear. This process that, that council Councilman Sledge is, is proposing and setting up mirrors what we currently do with beer permits. Now, I guarantee that, and I'm pretty sure that most of y'all don't come down to the council frequently. So you probably have not seen a lot of these beer permit processes go through. But it is a process that works extremely well. I've had it um, in my district two or three times where they've needed a beer permit. Most recently, the turnip truck. Uh, not only were they close to a park, but they were close to a residence. So we held the hearing at the council. Um, I supported it. The council supported it. Having this kind of quote unquote escape clause or still allowing y'all to have an option to get your permit is is a huge is I think a great compromise and I think is really well thought out and creative on Councilman Sledge's part. I'll tell you that when I've stayed in Airbnbs and other places um, in other states and when I've looked at Airbnb advertisements here in Nashville, I frequently see not a lot of parking on the street, just park at the park down, the, down, you know, a block away. Park at the church that's a block away. So this isn't just about prop, your property rights, but it's also about the property rights of not infringing upon others' parking and their ability on a Sunday morning to hold a church service, on a Wednesday night to hold a church service, or the many other services that they use. And also, quite frankly, at, the, at my Richland library, the, the moms can have parking spots to get in with their strollers close and not close enough to the library, not having to park two blocks away because the park parking lot is full of Airbnb renters. Now, fortunately, we haven't gotten to that spot, but I can see it happening. And I think that this process sets up a very fair situation where you still can maintain a way to get your permit, and the council's not taking away your right here because there is a well thought out process that has worked for many years. So with that, and, and I will add that I do think this is a political issue that the council will take up, take up very heatedly, and I'm sure I will see all of y'all at that public hearing as well. Mr. Tibbs. Um, so I, I guess com, um, Councilman Sledge, he, was he okay with the, um, the amendment to measure or your recommendation to measure from lot line to lot line or? I believe so, yes. And, okay. and if he chooses not to introduce that substitute, um, I mean, that's still an option also at council. Okay. Um, and I'm sure this is obvious, but the I guess we are conforming, though, with the state law. We're not going to have to deal with that. Like, this doesn't change the what we've already... What's, what, could you go back one slide? I keep on wanting to look at it, but it's... What is it called? Uh, this, this, 
Short-term rental act. Yeah. Oh, that should have. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> uh, never mind. Okay, but anyway, so does it? We don't. We're not going to have an issue with that, right? This does not conflict with the short-term rental act. Okay. I just want. I know those are kind of obvious things, but you know that's always will come back to us. So my biggest issue is not necessarily the churches or the park, honestly, but it is the schools, and because it's non-owner occupied, which I appreciate you asking that question, because I was a little concerned about that too. Um, you know, hotels have a hotel manager. If something's happening in the hotel, you call the manager and they beat on the door. <clears throat> when it's non-owner occupied, especially with the school, like you don't know what that 0.8% is. You know, that could be a child predator or anything, and that's right there, that's there for however many times. So, and that can't be, there's no regulation for it at all. So for a playground or a daycare center, that's where my issue really comes in. You know, maybe the church can help them out, you know, <laughs> but I mean, the issue is that is, that to me is putting a, a big danger. And it's, you know, it's 100 feet, It's and it's just for, uh, and like I said, in my issue as a school and a and a daycare, those are, I mean, to me, this is, uh, this, is a, this is not a lot asking. And as a matter of fact, it's something I think that is in good conscience. I mean, so you can have your rental property, but let's just not be able to have it where we could be putting our kids in danger. And you're right, it's only <coughs> point, maybe it's less than 0.8%, but I sure would hate to be the parent of that 0.8%. So, it, and it could be less than that, it could be 0.1, whatever the number might be, or 0 0.01. But the, the issue is, I do think that that is my concern with this. And so, all in all, I support the um, staff's recommendation, but that those are my two really ones that uh, affect me more specifically. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think I want to kind of clarify, um, following up on Commissioner Gobble's point. So it, basically what we're saying, I mean, we know there's no new STRPs allowed in our districts and our M districts anymore, right? Uh, not no, owner or not. Not, not on owner. So that's off the, so really what we're talking about with this is STRPs where we've said they're allowed, but within 100 feet of a church. That's correct. So we're continuing to narrow the geographies where we say that, that the STRPs can go. I mean, I, I, I'm really sort of struggling with that because we've, from a land use perspective, I don't know that we have a reason to say why they can't be within 100 feet of a church or a school. The example of the 505 and a lot of downtown where you do have that kind of tight-knit fabric and you've got uses that are in close proximity to each other that function well together. Um, I mean, I think if there was more data to show that this was truly an issue with those units that are next to a school or next to a church. I don't even know how many are going to be adjacent to a school. Um, I don't know how many schools are in the RM areas. I mean, I'm sorry, in the in the um, areas where STRPs are allowed. Like, I would be helpful to kind of get a feel for what are the areas that we're looking at in the city to understand. You know, where is this? Where are we going to see this interplay? Um, I guess I just don't have enough of a sense of what the problem is that this that this change is going to solve, um, and I'm not 100% comfortable with continuing to narrow um, the areas where we say that short-term rentals are allowed. I just just one clarifying point for for our own properties, they they continue to be eligible until 2022, okay. so they they can still come in and get permits now. Okay. Um. Yeah, so I, I, I'm, I think I'm in the same, the same group as saying a deferral, more information would be helpful. All right, it's time for a motion. So who wants to make a motion? I move approval of staff's recommendation. Second. It's a, it's a proper motion and a second. Any other discussion? So we probably, it looks like the votes are split, so we'll just go ahead and uh, raise your hands. All those in favor? Can, uh, can I ask, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Can I ask for a point of clarification? Yes, sir. If we reject this, but if, not saying we should, but I'm just saying if we did, would that make, take a deferral off the table? So if, if we reject this, there would need to be another motion. And so, uh, and then if there's a tie, there would need to be another motion until we got to a majority of, of, of the votes here. And then if, if we reject 
the bill, by a majority of our votes, it takes 27 votes at the council to pass, not 21. So that's the explanation. Mr. Sims, you got a question? Um, probably just to my fellow commissioners, I don't, I'm not, a, I am somebody that really struggles with short-term rentals and they're kind of uh, partly because the Economic Policy Institute's newest research just did, out in March this year shows how really harmful they are economically and how they impact affordable housing. But I think for this particular act, we really need data. We need to, really, and, and I don't, I'm not asking that we turn it down. I'm just asking that we have time to really see how big the problem is and the actual impact of it. All right, so we, uh, any other discussion on the motion to approve? Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. And raise your hand. Raise your hand. The four and no. Four. We'll need another motion. I move motion that we defer this. this and ask the staff to give us uh, clearer data about both the scope of the problem and the ramifications of the potential solution here. And so is it a one meeting deferral, two meeting, or what How is it? How long the, they need for or let's ask more, the staff more of the, sorry. Okay. <laughs> and the director, what would be, what do you, how much time would the staff need to, to look at? I'm sorry. Numbers? So there is a bill in this case. Um, so there are some procedural issues. The councilman is not here. So I think what one scenario is we defer it for a meeting so I can confer with him and ask for additional time. Um, but to really do what you're asking, we would need a minimum two meeting deferral to be able to cull through through the data. Um, and I think part of the complexity here is we can look at the um, the current infractions and how they relate, but then you really have to look in the future also and try to understand based on the current entitlements, based on where you can build these, how is that likely to change? And I think that's where we will need to make some assumptions and where you'll have, I think, some complexity. So. And I understand the. I think this one map, though, convinced me that we're dealing with some unintended consequences. Okay. So the count, so the councilman's not here. Um, so do you? So, uh, so would that be appropriate to yeah, defer it for one and then? We're, we're on the deferral okay. motion on discussion and okay. council. Uh, uh, Commissioner Johnson raised yes, her hand. Uh, so I just we'll wanted to, to offer because. As if this bill uh, pretend like we are trying to solve the problem, but I think as a commissioner's role is to look at the land use. So f as far as future land use policy uh, uh, in that you know, uh, prospect, is it appropriate to allow more short-term rental in MUN area, MUI zoning, MUZ zoning, MUI zoning, OG, OR, ORI? or OG, OR, ORI, this specific base zone usage other than short-term rental is more appropriate for that particular so section. That's the uh, question. So I think, you know, asking uh, staff to uh, how many program, uh, how many incident is a little outside of our scope. So we can ask our staff how many uh, property in that area within 100 feet of the church, that would be appropriate. So how many property we are dealing with? Well, uh, thank you, Commissioner. And uh, I brought up, I wanted our attorney to, to discuss what's appropriate for us to ask for. And the vice chair, uh, and I include myself in this, is that there are some areas in town where we have said there's appropriate uses for where these should go. And this alters that. And so I do believe that it's a proper, from my perspective as a chair, uh, that this is a proper request of staff for inf more information. So, I, you know, we've always had leeway on what our authority is or what's not. Um, but it is a clear land use where these should go or where they should not go. So um, my interpretation of that is that it's appropriate for us to get more information. So you may disagree with that, but <laughs> that's, that's my feeling. And we, you, we tried to pass it, and that failed. And so we're on the deferral motion for one meeting until you talk to the council member and come back. 
Can I just say, since Vice I was Chair. in favor of the deferral, um, and I don't know exactly what the math is that I envision in my head, but it would just be really helpful for me to see where we can, where short-term rentals are currently allowed, and at least maybe do an overlay of what schools are in that area, so we could just start to get a feel for what the landscape looks like. Is that maybe one thing that we could see? So uh, the information that, that we're asking for in the deferral motion, which was made by Commissioner Sims, uh, is it what specifically the director's asking, we're both talking about what would be appropriate without overworking the staff, I think is kind of, because there, there's a lot. So I think there's some mapping, general mapping that we could do, but what is the specific, is it where they're located and which ones would be affected by this? Is that... Well, I think the uh, opposition brought up two really good data points for us tonight that made me start thinking about it. And again, I want to say that I struggle with STR, so this is, I'm just trying to make sure that we're making the best decisions possible, particularly in those areas right now that do allow short-term rentals. And how many of those are actually close to churches or, or uh, you know, he used the 505 example. So um, I think maybe starting with the map, I can, off the top of my head, I would really need to think about this. We need to figure out where the baseline is, how many people we're actually impacting here, how many people, how many short-term rentals would we actually potentially um, be de denying when it comes back. So we're actually cause this is a land use problem, and it's a big time rental. And, and I don't know how we can make decisions just because it feels good when we don't know the scope of the problem how would we baseline it to know if we made this, if this particular policy made any difference, or even how big the problem is and whether or not we should be devoting this much zoning time when it's limited staff right now to it? So, Chairman, may I can clarify? Um, so, I've heard where are STRs currently allowed, and how many would we be impacting with the new distance requirements, where they're allowed. Just a visual of that. I mean, you don't have to tell uh, us. Here, you know. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Right, keep going. Okay. And then the two data points where we have had current infractions or current violations and the extent to which they relate to <coughs> the distance requirements established here. And then I also heard. Um, basically a series of overlays, and it, this may come out not, not this cleanly, um, but that helps, that helps us understand. Yeah, it would be, you know, since it's a future regulation, it would be important to see the right. properties that it affects in the future, because the current properties are grandfathered in, right, for the permit. Right. Uh, so I think spending a lot of time on, on the future properties affected is critical. Right. Uh, you know, the other information is good background and how many problems have been, because we did hear testimony on that, and if, uh, I think that's important. So, uh, Councilor, did you have a question? I, I had a comment to make about the, the data that you're requesting or that the commission, this motion is requesting, is that when you're going to be looking at this and basing your decision potentially off of infractions and complaints or, or how the area and who's a good actor and who's a bad actor, where those actors are, at the end of the day, what is not quantifiable is the amount of phone calls I get from constituents, is about the emails I get from constituents, and how many times constituents, it, it, it is until they are at their breaking point that they finally file a complaint. And it is at that breaking point that they get put in a system that is delayed and backed up. And we are constantly having to return in because of the state law and because there has to be multiple infractions within a year and things like that. And so I think the data that could be out there and some of the data tonight, I don't think it is really very easy to show you the accurate um, data point of the effect of short-term rentals <coughs> on my constituents. And I'm happy to come up with some kind of quiz or survey for council members to try to gauge their feelings on it. But I'll tell you, just as they're tired of, advocates are tired of coming up here, y'all are tired of coming up here, <laughs> council members, we are trying to, to 
find solutions to problem. We are not looking for, sol these are not solutions looking for a problem. I guarantee you that. This is, they're, they're, it's a constant moving target for us too to find peace and, of, of, and quality of life for our constituents. And at the end of the day, if that means piecemealing it and quilting it together, that's something that you can't, that, that's a lot of anecdotal things that, that you simply can't put a data point on. So that's my concern. That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, it's, I think that's part of the discussion. I, and, I, and I think it's, it's something that, that asking the staff to try to quantify, it's not going to, they can quantify some things that aren't going to give us a real picture, and we're going to continue to end up being here um, every six months, every year. Um, <coughs> and, and that's why it is a political issue and a political question for the council. I guess, so in my mind with these overlays, and I mean, I was going to say future use is important, but current use is important. The 505 is a perfect example. How many multi existing multifamily buildings are within 100 yards of a church or a school that, with, that are in appropriately zoned areas that could no longer receive? I mean, like those are the kinds of things that I think would be interesting to see and understand. So we are on discussion for the deferral motion Thank you. for one meeting. Is there anything else on the deferral? Any comments, questions from the commissioners? May I say one more thing? <coughs> Commissioner Sims, you, you're the motioner. <laughs> um, I really appreciate this. Uh, I think for the council people, they're in a very different role because you are a constituency. For us, it's all about land use, <coughs> and we don't get those phone calls. Um, and I don't I'm think that data. Yeah. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> and those and the, the data that that I'm requesting would not be around that. I think they're so that's so subjective and so. Um, uh, but I am concerned about if we keep limiting to where non-owner occupied can be, what's the impact of that? Because I'm all for us getting them out of the residential neighborhoods, which we've done. But where can they go then? And what's the impact of that? And right. that needs data. Thank you, Commissioner. We're on the deferral motion. All in favor of deferring the uh, bill one meeting, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Deferred one meeting. And we are going to take a, probably about a, a 10, 15 minute break. Come to order, commissioners. Are y'all ready? All right. So we are now on to item 12. And Lisa, you're recognized. Oh, you're being honored. Yeah. Okay. Item number 12 is a proposed text amendment. It would amend um, section 1716050 of the Metro Zoning Code related to short term rental properties owner occupied. As written, the bill would prohibit all bedrooms of an owner occupied unit from being advertised for availability. It would further require that the owner of an owner occupied um, unit be absent from the site for no more than 15 consecutive hours while guests are present. Here's the summary again of where we've been with short term rentals. I'm not going to review this in the same detail as I did on the first case. Um, this is the same as, as what I presented previously. Um, staff is rec recommending approval of the text amendment with a substitute. Um, the planning staff working with our, um, our colleagues in the codes department discussed the proposal um, as it related to uh, enforceability um, of what was pro pro proposed as written. So the substitute would remove the homeowner absence provision, um, as that was one that um, planning along with codes thought would be difficult, uh, if not impossible, to enforce. It would also refine the standard to prohibit whole home rental of owner-occupied units. Um, that is something that is trackable through host compliance, which is the current monitoring software that Metro utilizes. So by refining the standard to prohibit whole home rental of owner-occupied units, it makes the pr uh, proposal um, more enforceable. Um, again, as this is a refinement of the operational standards, staff recommends approval um, with the substitute uh, so that Metro Council can ultimately, ultimately make the decision. 
Thank you, Lisa. We'll open this item uh, up to it for a public hearing. Uh, the applicant is the councilman, Freddie O'Connell, who I want to see. Is Freddie here? I know he wasn't here earlier. He, he doesn't see. Yeah. Yes, his, thank you, Vice Chair. That's right. <laughs> Uh, so we'll go right into uh, the testimony. Anyone in the audience here in support? All right, you all know the drill. Come on up. Uh, you've got two minutes uh, for individuals, and then if you represent a group you, and requested five, oh, you can. It's going to be exciting. I thought I was going to speak with some of these folks, but they got mixed up. Uh, my name is Omid Yamini. I'm still at 1204 North Second Street. Um, that was such an exciting public hearing. You know, I come here just to hear the amazing things that get said at these. Um, the sterilization of land. I mean, that's that's a new one to me. Uh, and then there was, you know, somebody who finally admitted that these are mini hotels. Um, and then the next guy said, you know, nobody would want to buy my property if it's, you know, not able. And then the next guy said, I understand why people wouldn't want to live next to mini hotels. I agree with it. one of the commissioners who said, you know, there are unintended consequences. I wish you had been on the Planning Commission when we originally passed <laughs> the STR legislation because there has been far more unintended consequences <laughs> upon the residents of Nashville from STRs than vice versa. Um, so when you consider this legislation and get all, you know, uh, there's a lot of feelings uh, being felt by people who have money tied up in this. Imagine all of the residents across this city who have invested their savings into their homes and want to live in residential areas and un are unable to because they've been in inundated with these commercially used short-term rentals. Um, as far as the, the, this bill in particular, you know, again, it, to me, it's a no-brainer. We're trying to find ways to make sure that people that are uh, claiming to, you know, be owner-occupied and have this home-sharing thing actually be there. I mean, I don't understand why that would be a problem except for the fact that a lot of the people who have these owner-occupied permits aren't there and aren't around when they rent them. So, of course, you're going to hear a lot of opposition to that. I look forward to hearing what's said next. Thank you. <laughs> Pat Williams, 4301 Elkins. I believe that 12 does support <coughs> better enforcement of current SDR regulations. And let me just say that I believe a huge number of people have, when you're looking at statistics, numbers of complaints and so forth, I believe so many homeowners have given up making complaints because they know the enforcement isn't there. And anything that will help enforcement, I think is good. Please, please support for, um, Council Member O'Connell's bill and not the substitute. Thank you. Thank you. Logan Key, 1411 Fatherland Street in uh, East Nashville. Uh, folks like me were just ordinary folks. And what we are striving for and what we have been advocating for for the last three years is for neighborhood integrity. And that is the crux of this bill. I, my support for item 11 was rather passive. I feel very strongly about item 12 because I think the crux of the issue is neighborhood integrity. One thing to keep in mind, and, and, and Commissioner Haynes mentioned this earlier, these are one-year permits. And as great a critic as I've been about the original ordinance, the wisdom of the original ordinance is the fact that there were only one-year permits issued. And that was for a reason. This was a new land use, it was innovative, and there were many unknowns. And for that reason, the one-year permit was one of the beauties of the original ordinance, even though I think it was a bit too uh, generous. Another point to keep in mind in discussion, and I hope you have a discussion about this. We have had years and years before short-term rentals and vacation rentals were ever contemplated, we have had years of community planning in this city. And it's been very thoughtful and been very robust. At no time, am I aware, at no time have we made a community decision to take residential districts and invite whole home vacation rentals into our areas. And, and, and that's a vital point. I, I, am I opposed to vacation rentals in general? No. Hotels or vacation rentals, they can be anywhere. But residential zones are not the place. And that's why we have zoning, and that's what I think you need to have a conversation about. And so for that reason, in my opinion, as a matter of policy, this should not be controversial for you. This is not a close call. Whole home vacation rentals are not appropriate in residential areas, and I hope that you'll take that into consideration and take residential integrity as the paramount issue as you debate this issue. Thanks. 
Hello, my name is Court Blankenship. I live at 319 South 11th Street uh, in East Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I am very involved in the East End Neighborhood Association. We're trying to revive that uh, in part in doing that. I've been reaching out to my neighbors. I'm surrounded by short-term rental owners. Um, I also live next to one of these quote unquote bad actors. Um, some of the things that I've experienced are my yard being trashed. I have been cursed out at all hours of the morning asking people to please move inside and respect the neighbors. Um, I have been catcalled while inside my home in a sexual and threatening tone. Um, and I've had people trespass into my yard. When I have confronted the homeowner, I have been told, um, well, you know, I told them the rules. What can I do? I wasn't there. I have made 19 complaints in the last 18 months with the hotline and in turn had officers come out and meet me with every single one of these situations. Um, so all I can speak about is my own experience. And I deal with this all the time. You talk about tired, I am tired. And there needs to be something to regulate and solve these issues. I have no issues with the people that run and rent out their daddies because they're on the property. I have no issues with my neighbors that rent out a bedroom because they're on the property. But every single one of these instances that I am highlighting have happened when the homeowner was not present. And therefore, I am having to police my own property and my own safety. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm John Summers, 5000 Wyoming Avenue. I'm here on behalf of the Coalition for National Neighborhoods. A couple of points that have already been made. Um, this is land use policy in a general sense, but this particular bill doesn't deal with land use policy, so I hope that gives you a greater comfort level because it's really about procedures, and I really think that's a, a decision for the council. And I can say that having been a commissioner before. You know, there are decisions that certainly fall in your purview. And this comes through here because all of these bills come through we did that in 608 because we wanted your input from a land use standpoint. I also would say that um, unintended consequences. What I haven't had a lengthy conversation with Councilman O'Connell about this, but I think what he is trying to do here is to try to address some of the unintended consequences of the original bill, which none of us anticipated. This is not an issue that Nashville's dealing with. It's being dealt with all over the country. Short-term rentals have created problems all across the country. And we now have a $30 billion industry with Airbnb that's pretty much going around and trying to tweak things to their advantage. And that was unfortunate with our bill. And that I don't think this commission, I know many members of the council that have told me that voted for it, did not understand the full impact it was going to have on our communities. And I really want to thank you all for having to listen to all this. I know you don't enjoy it. We don't enjoy coming. But there's a business out here and there's a business interest. You've heard it time and time again tonight. This bill is only going to affect owner-occupied permits. So all these investors out here, this doesn't affect them. So this is about, are we gonna have party houses? How do we try to grapple with the party house issue in the residential neighborhood? And there are some people that go off and rent their houses and don't really care how it impacts their neighbors, unfortunately. And Councilman um, O'Connell is trying to address that, uh, although this doesn't go nearly as far as we'd like for it to go, quite frankly. Um, I do think the staff has come up with a better recommendation. I initially was concerned about the substitute, but I think it probably will work better given our current um, system. And I cannot let this pass without raising it to you, because the last time we were, I was here and I was talking about home occupation, one of my critiques was that we weren't looking at the enforcement issue in terms of the business occupation permit bill that Councilman Rosenberg has proposed. And I really want to thank the staff, because they specifically <laughs> look at the enforcement issue. And I would re respectfully submit that when that bill comes back up, the Rosenberg bill, is that we've got to talk about the enforcement because enforcement is really problematic, if not impossible, with most of these bills. Um, but I think this is a step forward. I think it's a pretty modest step forward. But I think um, it will help and give the council some opportunity to try to address this issue. Again, it doesn't change land use policy. Um, it doesn't change where you can get a permit. Um, it just basically puts some regulations. And I thought it was really interesting from some of the um, speakers earlier, one in particular, that said, well, they want to be treated like hotel motels. 
I'd love for them to be treated like hotel motels. I'd love for them to have to have somebody on site. I'd love to have them have limitations on what they can and cannot do like hotels and motels do. I'd love for them to have to meet safety inspections at the level of hotel and motels do. That's the travesty in where we are, is that we're not holding these guys to the same accountability. They're in the same business. They're just approaching it from a different angle, different standpoint. And they're getting away with a lot of things they should not get away with that we require of other businesses in terms of hotel motel in this community. So listen up to what he said. I think um, there's some merit in that. Um, I appreciate your time, appreciate your service. I'm sure I'll see you again. I'll be back up on the next bill. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Good evening. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Uh, I'm actually kind of still listening on this one, but I, I did want to jump in the shorter line. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I just wanted to make a note about the staff recommended substitute bill. Um, it specifically carves out um, to where consolidated ownership HPRs can still list as whole houses. And I have a lot of people in my district who you know, have invested in dadus behind their primary residence. And they, you know, it's much easier to list a whole space than it is shared space on Airbnb. And given that those are detached units, um, generally the detached accessory dwelling unit is separate from the main house. Um, I think it would be great if we could, could carve out that same permission for them to continue to list as a whole unit rather than a shared space um, so they can continue to to rent and you know these dadu um, owner occupied airbnbs are some of the least problematic that i have in my district they're generally you know owner on premises um, very well run so i would like to i know this is not the place to make an amendment but to propose an amendment but i just wanted to enter that to the public record in case the sponsor's listening so thank you all thank you Councilman. anyone else wishing to speak in support seeing none anyone wishing to speak in opposition come on up welcome Thank you for the time. I am a teacher for Metro at Lockland in East Nashville. I also reside in East Nashville at 4426 Saunders Avenue, 37216. I moved in here, I've moved here to Nashville with $26 in my pocket to become a teacher. I worked five jobs to buy my condo, um, my first place here, and I did not pay a premium. Luckily, we did get um, our HOA has voted, we're right on 2nd Avenue. So, um, but I was driving Uber, Lyft, um, tutoring after school, blah, blah, blah. And I um, have realized now through this, um, being able to do that with my place, that I could afford to stay here. I could afford to live in the city and teach in the city. Nashville is becoming a white collar city and Airbnb allows blue collar people to live where we work. Not allowing teachers to rent their homes in the summer is a tax on the teacher. It's an attack. Our police officers, our firefighters, I have um, a friend right now that's in the Navy who just got called to orders and he is short term renting his home right now as he fights for our rights. Um, oh. This is my husband's phone. I don't know the couch. Um, but I just wanted to share that, you know, it's not, if we look in here, I bet I'm not the only blue collar worker in here. So it's not these investors from Chicago and California. We're trying to be responsible. We have cameras in our homes. We advertise, we live in the basement of our, in a, um, we have a basement suite. So. I'm still making that sacrifice of not having a whole home. Thank you. Thank you. You can finish your thought. It's okay. Thanks. <laughs> You're um, I was just saying that we make that sacrifice to be able to afford to live here, and I don't know how that would affect us either with the, without that being defined in the law. In the law. Thank you. Hello, my name's Elizabeth Burnett and I live at 4202 Aberdeen Road. I'm actually in council person um, Kathleen Guest Murphy's district. 
Um, I've lived in the same house for 15 years, and three years ago, I got a short-term uh, rental permit so that I could um, rent out my house when I was not there. I do travel for work, and I have a sick grandchild who lives in Massachusetts that requires me to be gone from home a lot. Um, this has certainly provided me um, additional income, but one thing, and I know this sounds crazy, is it provides me some security. I have someone living in my house when I'm gone. And yes, I do make income off of it, but we've had a little bit of a rash of car break-ins in my neighborhood. I live in a neighborhood that doesn't have a lot of garages, and it really does give me a lot of security. Um, and y'all can say, well, Ms. Burnett, you're going to be grandfathered in, so you don't have the same issue that a new person applying would be. But the way the Airbnb works, when I list a whole house rental, which I guess I would be able to do if I'm grandfathered in, host compliance is going to flag me. It's going to tag me because they're not going to know that I'm grandfathered in. And as soon as I get tagged, then I'm going <coughs> to probably have to incur some legal expenses to be able to say that I'm grandfathered, okay, somebody's shaking their head, but that's not how it is. But it still is going to cause me extra work um, to have to justify um, that I am in compliance with the old law. So I certainly would like for you all to consider allowing us to be able to continue to rent out owner-occupied while we're out of town. Thank you. My name is Susan Berridge. I live at 1014 Horseshoe Drive in 37216 and I just wanted to echo what the previous speaker said and what the gentleman said the last speaker of the last group many many of us who hold who hold owner occupancy um, um, owner occupancy permits are on site but our properties are still listed as whole home my personal situation is I have an entire guest suite um, which was built on the back of my house before I moved into it. There is a door connecting the guest suite with my part of the house, which means that my Airbnb guests have their own space when they, um, when they come and stay with me. I am on the property um, almost 24 seven because I work a lot from home. I don't even rent my property while I am out of town. My grumpy old neighbor who wouldn't even sign my letter when I wanted to get a permit now says that he prefers my Airbnb to his noisy full-time renters on the other side of him. So I think there are many of us that are gonna fall through the cracks because as you've heard before, the, the language that host compliance and that Airbnb uses is different to the language that is being presented in this bill. We are listed as whole home rentals or entire home rentals. And then there are subcategories, but I'm sure there will be many situations where many of us are gonna get caught up with these language difficulties. My name's Kristen Kosh. I live at 396 36 Avenue North. Um, I as well have a home where there is a separate entrance and a separate space um, that we rent out. And actually, it's been able, I'm as well just a normal girl living here in Nashville and trying to make it. And um, my husband put himself through school, not only undergrad, but pharmacy school. And, um, our student loan payments are more than our mortgage payment. And the way that we're able to make it work is by renting out this space, which as you've heard, is listed as a whole space because it is separate. Um, but I also want to, more important than me and my husband, is we have lots of friends who are nurses that are working currently in ICU that can't be here. And I do want to speak on their behalf. Hello, I am a nurse working full time in the ICU at Vanderbilt. I care deeply for all my patients, and my career is rewarding because I am a tangible. Dif I make a tangible difference in people's lives every day. But unfortunately, caring for Nashville's sickest re residents only pays half the cost of living in the city. Airbnb is the only thing I've found that fits with the uniquely demanding schedule of intensive care nursing, and also allows me to make ends meet. I work with sever several other nurses who are Airbnb hosts for the same reason. I'm dedicated ICU nurse and I work more than 13 hour shifts taking care of other people and their families. When you factor in the commute, it takes away from my home and my family for more than 15 hours of the day. I would have to work an additional 67 shifts to bring in the minimal in annual income I earn through Airbnb. That's an additional 1,005 hours away from my family. Airbnb has enabled me to make ends meet while increasing the time I can spend at home with my family. There's a false perception that most Airbnbs are owned by people with multiple homes who are just trying to maximize their revenue, as they mentioned 
investors. I'm not an investor. These nurses are not investors. I do know that there are bad eggs, just like with everything else, but I think there's alternative ways to handle it. Maybe like a three strike thing. I don't know. I'm just trying to come up with ideas. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, good evening. My name is Brittany Sear, and I live on Strauss Avenue in East Nashville. Um, when I moved here, I made the difficult decision to leave the workforce for a while to care for my two children. They're now three and five. And Airbnb has created a lot of opportunity pr for me to provide to my family in these years that we're on one income, and that's a difficult thing to be on one income. So um, I prepared a little bit to speak to on the, this bill specifically. Um, I believe the main purpose of this bill is to reduce the unintended effects some bad actor STRPs create for neighborhoods. However, I believe the current laws already provide neighbors adequate opportunity to report codes violations. That reporting method already targets individual bad actors, and I believe with the increased number of code enforcement staff that was hired last year, these complaints hopefully can be dealt with effectively. As a permanent host who works diligently to keep up with and comply with all the regulations, I support those efforts to weed out those bad actors. In fact, Ms. Berkeley Allen, I don't know if she's still here, but I was reading a letter that she addressed you all with, um, and she made a very good point in her written statement to the committee that it would penalize, this bill would penalize owner-occupied permit holders who are not the perceived violators and, and indirectly benefit non-owner-occupied properties. Um, additionally, some of the people have already spoken to this, marketing our space as a shared space will lead to lower revenue due to pricing and booking levels, and will lead us, um, w I'm sorry, will lead to a reduced tax revenue for the city. Uh, this is in contrast to the staff recommendation that the impact would be revenue neutral. Um, I also understand that our tax revenue contributes to the affordable housing fund, which would obviously see its funding reduced to support its goals. Um, the reduced revenue for us would cost us substantially. Um, we currently hire our neighbor to help us manage the property and clean the property, and I would no longer be able to afford to hire her. Not only would I not, I would also not be able to provide for my family in the way that I have. I'm running out of time, so I'll just make um, one last point here. I don't believe that our style of short-term rentals actually removes housing from the rental housing stock, nor changes to the primary use of the property. Since we live on site, we care for the outward appearance. We look we look after our guests and make sure that they're not being disrespectful to thank the community. You. Thank, um, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey there, Jason Jenkins. I live at 1403 <clears throat> Russell Street. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach here um, in that we don't do it for money. Uh, we never have. We've been doing it for almost five years now. Uh, we started renting our room in our house, um, which is just an actual room in our house, and we met people from all over the world and were constantly booked. And just, I was anti it to begin with. My spouse insisted we do it. Um, we did it. It was fun. Money's nice. It's great. But um, We've met so many amazing people through this. So we approached it uh, a little bit later and built a dadu behind our house. Um, we have since rented it out. We live on our property 24-7. We're always home. My spouse works from home. We follow all the rules. We pay all the taxes. We do everything. Um, there are constant bills coming down the pipeline that seem to want to affect us as well, but we're trying to obey the minefield of the rules that are constantly changing. Um, as far as the grandfathered in uh, comment that keeps getting made, we're a weird exception also in that last year we lost our permit due to an error in the codes office that BZA, once we appealed, determined was an error in the codes office. So in that circumstance, we would be forbidden to or have to go through a lengthy process, if at all, to re get a new permit. And, and you know, that may be an odd case. I get it. But it was definitely a case that happened to us. We incurred a lot of legal fees. Great, whatever. Um, I know there's not as much sympathy on the financial side to this, but people's livelihoods do depend on it. But it's also such a great interaction with people who visit our city to show them our neighborhoods, to show them who we are as people, to show them that Nashville is a welcome, a welcoming city to all people from France to Singapore to wherever. They come all across the world to come to Nashville to visit us because they hear how amazing our city is. It's crazy to do a sweeping law that affects so many thousands of people without doing proper research and actually looking into the cases one by one. That's it. Thank you. Hi. My name is Deborah Volley, and I live at 2445 Eastland Avenue in District 6. Um, I'm voicing my opposition to this bill, BL 2019-79. Um, I am a realtor with multiple clients with dadus and properties that have separate entrances with private basements or apartments that they rent out. 
Um, I also have many clients and friends who are currently uh, building and constructing dadus or finishing out their basements. And if this goes into pending legislation, they will be greatly affected by this bill. Um, I'm not gonna try to appeal to your, you know, this emotions are not why you're here. Um, but I would ask for an inquiry, to be, an inquiry to be made to see how many people search for whole home, whole home versus shared space on these SDR websites. Um, this law would no longer allow these uh, hosts to advertise in this way, which would greatly affect their income potential because of how people search for places to stay. Um, I'm not sure the exact reason this particular solution made sense for the sponsor, but it doesn't seem to have been written with the knowledge of how the vacation, vacation rental sites work. Um, I respectfully ask you to vote no or at least defer this bill. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gabe Wicks. I live at 919 Montrose Avenue. Uh, I live in the historic overlay district. Uh, my family and I decided to build a daddy a couple of years ago. Um, as you know, in the historic overlay, there are a lot of additional steps. We followed every law. We spent considerable extra money to make sure we were in compliance fully with the historic overlay. I support that. Uh, I'm also fully in support of enforcement. I understand the problem you're going after here. I'm in support completely of enforcing it. However, I'm going to urge you to, as some of my previous speakers have said, not sweep away the good actors with the bad. Uh, for those of us who live on site and have a dadu, and uh, are you know good neighbors? I, I have neighbors that rent my space out, you know, for their family when they stay in town. I mean, we're we're good parts of our neighborhood. Uh, I would like to see enforcement of people's homes that are sitting there without anybody watching over them and causing problems. I get that. Let's enforce that. Let's absolutely enforce that. <clears throat> this is not the way to do that. Allowing someone to do a simple database sweep on this program to decide that you must not be in compliance really doesn't look at the actual issue. It is gonna punish people who are law-abiding citizens who just want to be able to do this within the confines of the law and have been. So I'm, I'm asking you to, to please be reasonable and to please consider that there should be some subdivisions within this bill before it passes as it does right now. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tom Kesey. I'm a I live at uh, 1101 North 8th Street. Um, I'm a builder, and uh, in my neighborhood, we're allowed to have dadus. And uh, I am currently building two dadus, and I've been helping people um, with their Airbnbs or helping them rent their properties out. And, um, you know, we've, I've got uh, a guy that's a, um, a stay at home dad that I'm helping them right now, and um, this would greatly Im impact him and um, you know I'm trying to help these people you know get a leg up and you know this type of policy would be like kicking uh, people who are trying to do something trying to help themselves and um, and it would you know adversely affect them and so um, that's one thing that I've been personally trying to do is help people in my community and this would adversely affect the people that I've been trying to help Evening Commissioners, Grant Hammond, 340, <coughs> 342 Harrison Street in Nashville. Um, Bill 608 made uh, owner-occupied a residential uh, conforming land use. Um, and I understand the spirit of this bill is really to help curtail a problem that exists within owner-occupied. And the problem is people who inaccurately claim their properties as primary residences and then proceed to lease them out over 365 days. That is a problem that we as the realtor community, um, the builder community, and the renter community want to solve. Those are bad actors. Uh, those are causing problems for the rest of us. We would like to see that, pro that problem solved. However, as currently worded, uh, this bill would flag lawfully operating uh, owner-occupied dadus, mother-in-law suites, upper-level apartments, and any space that has a separate entrance that's considered a whole home on the rental platforms. Simply rewording that language may solve the issue uh, that was brought forth uh, by everyone before you. Lastly, this bill would disproportionately punish those who have long extended absences for their jobs. Um, those are people like musicians uh, who quite a few take advantage 
of uh, leasing their properties while they're on tour, um, traveling nurses or nurses in the ICU, um, or members of our military. I know of seven, personally uh, know of seven people currently deployed in the Middle East who are currently leasing out their properties as a way of keeping them uh, while they are deployed. Um, it's beyond me why we would try to punish those people. I think the wording in this bill currently is not uh, well worded. Please vote to defer while we work on language in this bill so that we can pass it when we worked. Thank you. My name is Penny Foreman. I'm a realtor in Nashville, and I'm not gonna speak on behalf of property owners. I'm gonna speak on behalf of the people who use these Airbnbs. My daughter is a lobbyist in Washington State. She doesn't live close to the Capitol in Olympia. She rents an Airbnb for two months during session. We are a capital city. We have Congress people and senators, local politicians who do not live anywhere near our capital and may need to live here in an Airbnb for two or three months during session. We also have a great deal of construction. I was an iron worker in Local 492. I know that a lot of iron workers, carpenters, electricians, and other skilled trades people can't afford to live in this city, but they work here, and they may live as far out as Johnsonville or up in Kentucky, and they come here and they rent Airbnbs, these kind of properties so that they can work here and help build our city. And we're fixing to tell them there's not gonna be any place for them. And we're fixing to tell our legislators that they're gonna have to stay in hotels when they might rather be in a place where they can share with their family. We're gonna tell the people that rent these places, we don't want them here. And they're here helping us, working for us. And that's not right. So I'm gonna ask you to vote no on this and to vote no on any of these three bills. Lisa, the screen's on the wrong. Hello, I'm Andrea oh, hold Brown. On. Hold sorry. on one second. Yes. We're going to get the screen back to where it's supposed to be, so we're... We got... <laughs> Thank you. Andrea Brown, I'm um, at 1423 Benjamin Street in East Nashville. Um, I'm just, I'm gonna be very short because I'm basically I'm gonna, would say everything that was said before. I do have a dadu in my backyard, um, just almost a year now. And I built it with the idea of my aging um, mother and father that I may have to move in there and they move in my house one day. Um, but it's been fun to be able to do it, but I feel like, um, that right now to help pay for that and just to pay for my um, financial, um, I'm trying to say, um, school loans, um, I have, that's supplementing my income. It helps a lot, but um, the main thing is just being able to do that um, and say that it is a whole home. Um, I'm not renting out my home. My neighbors um, have never had any issues with my dadu and um, I'm there um, most of the time, uh, except when I'm at work. So just please think to defer this bill um, because of the language mainly. Thanks. Hi, I'm Darren Cunningham, 1015 12th Avenue South in Nashville. Um, a little torn on this one because I think there's some bad actors out there who have come into the short-term rental space and they pose as if they're actually going to occupy these properties and they do not. I'm, I think those are bad actors when they need to go. So for that reason, I think this is more of an enforcement issue, not a blanket policy issue, because when you issue a blanket policy like this, as you've heard from the people who were up here previously, it wasn't, <clears throat> in my opinion, well thought out. Um, there, we always use the term unintended consequences. That's going to happen everywhere, right? But the, the idea, it's been brought up several times about a dadu not being listed as a whole home. I think they should have that right to do that. The owners occupy the home in front of that and don't occupy behind there. They want to protect their asset. I think they should be allowed to have that. But I do think there's enforcement issues in short term rentals across the board. I sympathize with the story from the young lady over here. Uh, it's awful. Um, 
and I think that uh, there should be <coughs> greater depths of enforcement. I know it costs money to do that. Where do you get that money? Uh, I know short-term rentals bring in across the board a lot of money for the city. In fact, we, we estimated based on validated facts that last year, 2019, short-term rentals brought in between the permit fees and the hotel taxes over $28 million in tax money to the city. So anyhow, I don't know if that puts a chip or a dent in the idea of enhancing enforcement, but I think enforcement needs to be increased um, and don't penalize the people who continue to do the right things based on the restrictions that were put in place originally by everybody within codes and planning. Thank you. Hello, my name is Paul Martin. I live in the Edge Hill community. I would just echo what the uh, other representative and other speakers have said that for those who've done legal bad news, that that language would be adjusted. And I absolutely sympathize with the other lady that spoke. I live down the street from two, um, two Belmont, um, Belmont houses and they're difficult to live by and if they were SDRPs, I, I probably would feel the exact same way. For those of us who are on site, who are there the entire time with the dadu in the backyard, I, I really wish you would adjust the language for some protection there for those of us who have, have invested to do that correctly. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tiffany Curtis. I live on 8th Street, 8th Street near Cleveland Park. I not only stand with all in opposition to items 11 and 12, but specifically this particular bill. I feel it's important to first state that I do not have an STRP. I don't make any money from an STR. Um, I do live, however, I live near numerous STRs. Um, I am, in fact, surrounded by them. And I am in an unpopular category where I actually enjoy it. Uh, it involves the life of the city. This is why we live in the city, is to enjoy the activities. And I have experienced nothing but respectful occupants, respectful owners who are more invested in their neighborhoods and the safety and community of their neighborhoods. They're there to manage the property and they have uh, legal and, and, and well-managed dadus. So I, as well, um, would like to uh, ask you to consider to rectify the language in this bill. Um, from someone, again, who does not have an STR to make an exception to the Bill of Owner-Occupied Properties regarding dad use. Thanks for your time. Good evening. Thanks for being here and listening to us all tonight. My name is Elise Renzino. I live at 1027 McClurkin in 37206. Um, before I start, I do want to acknowledge how awful that I feel for the woman who spoke earlier about the awful experiences that she's endured living next to an irresponsibly hosted short-term rental. Um, I know I don't speak on behalf of all hosts, but any responsible host that I know does not endorse that type of behavior, um, and we definitely don't take joy in those kind of stories, and we would like to see those bad actors get weeded out. I share your, as Planning Commission and Metro Council's concerns about those who operate rentals unlawfully and irresponsibly. While the sponsor isn't here to clarify this, I'm assuming that this bill aims to provide a solution to the companies and individuals who falsify documents in order to claim Nashville residency. As a permitted and lawful owner-occupied host myself, who works diligently to keep up with and comply with all of the ever-changing regulations, I do support true efforts to weed out these folks. However, this bill does not seem to accomplish that. Instead, it once again harms residents with legitimate permits and legitimate situations that would qualify for permits. Perhaps the protocol used to prove residency should be amended, as lawful residents would have no difficulty supplying additional documentation. Rather than further restrict those of us who are doing things the right way, um, sorry. <clears throat> Um, I think it would be more prudent that efforts are taken to enforce the regulations and laws that already exist. If codes are to prioritize enforcement against the 1,200 plus short-term rentals that operate illegally right now, that would reduce the number of short-term rentals in Nashville by almost 20%. That's a far more effective solution to party homes and other concerns than adding another new law. Please vote no to this bill. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, and the sponsor is not here, uh, we'll declare the public hearing closed. No one else wishing to speak. And Commissioner Tibbs, you want to go first? Sure. Um, 
Uh, so I do have one question about, so the other part of it, the may not be a limited liability entity that, um, in, in my understanding that part right, or um, I'm in 17.16. I see your face, Lisa, that I'm probably not. That's a substitute. Okay, so don't even worry about that other part of it. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that, because I, I, no one ever talked about it. Um, Lisa, she's got that look on her face like, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm trying to find one. I just made her. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Well, it's actually on the first part of it. Um, so on the page, original yeah, bill. the original, 65. The original bill. So 65. Oh, okay. So that part is totally <clears throat> Correct. Okay. And just for me then, could you switch back to the, the two things that were actually up? Just, um, I didn't go back far enough last time. Uh, go back to the, well, is it? There, there it is. Okay. Um, okay, so actually, so now I'm a little bit different about owner-occupied. Um, I Just to be consistent with myself, I've, I've not as... I don't have a lot of opposition to this, actually. Um, I know this does get into some particulars of it that might be, but I do kind of feel like there are some unintended, unintended consequences. And I'll wait for um, Vice Chair to mention what uh, Freddie O'Connell actually put in his email as well, since I'm not as versed on it. But I do feel, I, I feel less about this one, honestly, because uh, they are, my issue has always been how communities are decimated by when um, non-owner occupied in a community, and I feel like when you are an owner, even if you go, you know, you know, you're working on weekends and you're back. I know that things happen when you're not there, but still, there is still a, a different type of owner regulation. I guess I feel like when you're there, and if it's in your, especially dadus and. Uh, uh, Things like that. I mean, I also um, on the historical commission. So the, the gentleman who brought up about the all the <coughs> difficult things that we definitely make sure that happens when in a an historic overlay. So anyway, I, I I won't belabor that thought, but I um I am not necessarily feel like this is uh, as a, I'm not as opposed to not doing it. So I, I guess I'm. Either I'd say defer it just so we can get the. I guess I'd be more um, into deferring it so we can get make sure the regulation, the the terminology is correct, uh, because I, I'm, you know, be consistent. I'm okay with the owner occupied. Kind of, just kind of kept talking. I think. But. <laughs> I did, uh, Commissioner Tibbs. I, hope I, I did, did want to let you know that the language that you were talking about in regards to the. Um, uh, limited liability entity, that's existing language that's in the code that would remain. But we're not changing that. Though. We're not changing okay. that. So the um, where it says that the owner of the property has to be like one, two, three that are listed there on page 65, all so of that is existing language that's remained. Okay. It's only the underlined part that would be added by Councilman O'Connell's proposal that we're actually recommending be not added. Okay. Does that? I, I knew you'd figure it out. Yes. And um, I did also want to mention that um, having had a couple of conversations with Councilman O'Connell, and he um, indicated that I could share this as well, was that he is working with um, John Cooper in the council office, um, Attorney John Cooper, on further clarifying the language um, to uh, exclude dadus or, um, you know, the mother-in-law suites, those sorts of things from this regulation. And so he is um, working on that. They've been communicating today um, to look at how to get that language into an amendment um, so that the types of dadus uh, that we've heard about, that they could continue. Councilor. Thank you. Um, I just, I guess a disclaimer for my fellow commissioners is I did not run for this seat to come and tell you all that everything's a political decision and should go to the council. I swear, I promise. <laughs> but this is one of those where it's an allowed use and we're kind of tweaking the allowed use. And so, you know, this might be more of a, a council issue than a commission issue. I'll tell you, I'm very torn on it. Um, you know, we hear about the bachelorette parties and things like that. And, and quite frankly, if I had an owner occupation 
occupied, and I have a very close personal friend um, who, who has an owner occupied to help pay his note. He doesn't want to be there when the bachelorette parties are there. <laughs> I wouldn't want to necessarily, I know I don't want to be there if I rented my house out to an right? I would like go stay with my father. Um, so like I can understand that there are times when you want to rent out your entire house and when it's a single family home um, that you don't want to be like locked in the in the attic feeling like you can't come out or something right there's got to be a way to 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 King Solomon this and split the baby and find some language that makes this work um, I am I'm very sure that Councilman O'Connell can find some way hopefully to tweak this some more because I, I don't want to just throw throw every owner occupied out and say you either can't run out everything or you have to like kind of sneaky you know it's four bedrooms but you know three beds or, or I guess three bedrooms but four beds something like that because I'm, I'm concerned that it's going to open up a wormhole there that we have you know could be tricky on enforcement or inviting people to be dishonest and that's never I think our intent either so um, I, I would like to see what Councilman O'Connell can come up with and I'm at the will of the Commission Commissioner Jones thank you uh, thank you again for everybody come here and speaking and I really appreciate that and I think what I heard is everybody agree on we are having problem with enforcement so the question is if this proposal will actually uh, give everybody tool for the good enforcement and I heard uh, it will not and the language is not defined as far as enforcement is concerned and uh, I am concerned, I, I understand uh, where Councilman O'Connell is coming from as far as intention is concerned, but I think the proposed substitute as it's written is, has uh, unintended consequences and it will not uh, uh, address properly Dadu or mother-in-law apartment and so forth, or, you know, uh, people who are abide by uh, little intention of owner occupied short term rental permit and then uh, operating under the permit without no complaint. So, by uh, jumping into new substitute, will uh, further create further confusion and will not a community a good tool to uh, enforce or complaint. Uh, because you know, complaint and enforcement is uh, unfortunately it's complaint driven. So you know, the tool is how can we make it easier to you know, the community to complain. So at the same time, what we have to think about is how is it uh, reasonable and practical to uh, introduce uh, the regulation for easy for everybody to follow and obey. So for that sense, uh, I don't think this language is defined. I would like to defy it and hear from uh, Council Member O'Connell and you know more defined, a better language for me to personally uh, uh, support uh, you know, for further regulation. So I'm uh, in, uh, in favor of a defy this uh, one meeting. Commissioner Gobble. Uh, there's several reasons I'm not a councilman or a lawyer. <laughs> so, I understand all this is just one of many. But uh, I, I tend to agree. I think <clears throat> the concept of articulating what owner-occupied is is something that probably needs work. Uh, and But how you deal with the Daidu or something else, uh, I think... So uh, one meeting deferral or something like that seems like a logical way to address those issues, but it will eventually be a political solution. Commissioner like, Sam? Uh, I experientially have had really bad experience with people who say they're owner-occupied and it's not. So, And I know in neighborhoods like Edge Hill, there's a lot more of those people who say they're actually occupying and they're not. <coughs> so I think the intent of this bill is really good. I think the technicalities of the bill still needs to be worked on, so I would wholeheartedly agree with the deferral until we can get with Freddie. Ms. Haynes. I, I agree. This is an enforcement issue for those bad actors 
Um, so this bill needs more work before I can support it. So I'll support a deferral. Vice Chair. Um, yeah, I agree that there needs to be some work, and I think there's other options out there. I know for sure I don't support the 15 consecutive hours part. That I don't see how you would enforce. I think we're creating a nightmare for the city if we put something like that in there. Um, and it would, you know, neighbor against neighbor. Your car's been gone for 10 hours today, and therefore you're in trouble. Like, that's not a good situation to create. Um, but I agree there is some issues with this being, uh, you know, you don't want to, like, see the loophole created by people renting out in tight, you know, in our occupied homes getting rented out. Um, but I'm very sympathetic to what some of the other folks said, you know, that if you're a teacher and you're gone for two months over the summer, this is a good way for you to be able to maintain your housing and afford your housing. And I think that's, you know, again, we talk about affordability in Nashville. We need creative solutions. We need to be thinking about that. So, you know, I would just suggest, I, I don't think one meeting deferral is necessarily going to get there. Um, maybe it gets there enough for us to pass this on to council, and then hopefully council takes some time to really ask some of these questions and dig deep on what the real problem is. The problem is this loophole. We need to figure out how to close that, but we want to leave options open for people who are working hard in Nashville and need to have a way to afford their housing, and that's a council discussion. So I just want to say um, I have heard from multiple attorneys in our legal shop that this is an issue, and it's a problem. And so I think we obviously want to come up with the precise language to address the problem, and if there are other tools, such as what we require for licensing, we need to be open to it. But I don't think in any way this is kind of made up on the margins based on no. what I've heard from, from legal. And so we'll, we'll also maybe um, talk with the legal team to see if there's anything else that we can add to this that would be more precise in terms of how we... Um, how we look at it. It's not just about weeding out the bad actors. It's really about um, setting an expectation that everyone can, can understand. And if you're being defined as this with these standards, then we want to create that consistency and clarity for neighbors and for property owners. So um, we're there. Um, but if you're sort of in some gray area in between, and a few people are taking advantage of that, we have to address that. But we also, what I'm hearing with both this case and the, and the last one is that accountability starts not just with Metro enforcing it, but with how we are defining who's getting what entitlements. And so um, that's what this is really trying to get to. And so we'll also, I think, work on sort of some of the background to talk a little bit about the host compliance and some other things that I think will give a context for how we're approaching the problem. So I just wanted to put that on the record. Thank you for your... Thank you, Director. But I would, and I would also say that a lot of the things that, that may take this before it becomes final legislation are outside of our purview. And, and mm -hmm. you know, like one of the things I'm thinking is maybe the short-term rental for some, you know, you can't do it for less than three weeks because that would let the teacher who's gone for two months over the summer continue to sublet their house for two months. Right. So there's things out there that, you know, can be done, but that's not going to be it for us or even in what you put together in the next couple of meetings, that's going to be a discussion at the council level would be my guess. Right. So I guess with that, I will make a motion that we defer this by, do you want one? How, what do you want? Can you give me some advice about, um, sorry, Lisa, <laughs> about where we are procedurally? Um, so there is a council bill, okay. um, and it's scheduled for public hearing February 4th. Um, so we don't have another planning commission meeting before that. Now, the bill was introduced more than 30 days ago, and so the council rule essentially says that on public hearings for zoning, um, you can't hold a public hearing until one of two things have happened, that you have a recommendation from the Planning Commission or that more than 30 days have passed since introduction. More than 30 days have passed since introduction. So if the council member chose to, he could move forward with the public hearing, um, not third reading. Um, and so uh, one, either one of the deferrals is really deferral to whatever day is really open at this point, we would just have to have conversation with him because it wouldn't be able to go forward to third reading until we had But then I think I would recommend doing a one meeting deferral 
um, and then working with him on the timeline, do you think? Or I kind of, yeah, Chairman? We, we have the you, council member representative. I feel like when here. I get into the council, we, they start getting us, we don't, cranky. Yeah. <laughs> well, we don't always get cranky just there. Um, maybe we could roll this to the heel and someone who's not a fellow council member could reach out to that council member and ask okay. what he would prefer on deferral. <clears throat> So I, I guess if, if the body's willing, I'm willing to make a motion to just roll this to the heel. Someone reach out to Freddie. So, we're, so about bedtime. A lot of our fellow commissioners uh, so. don't know what that means, but it means to oh, sorry, uh, sorry, get rid of that, uh, that put technical talk. To put it uh, to hear it next after the next hearing. So I, and allow uh, the, the council lady to finish the to conversation, and, and maybe a staff member could reach yeah. out to. Uh, in in coordinates uh, in accordance with the law and open records, I would prefer that uh, oh, well, someone that. else reach out to the councilman to see his wishes. Yeah, we will on the staff. So. Oh, we've done that. Okay. Uh, well, well, we can. Uh, could if, we just roll it to the hill and give him some time to have bed? This is about this is about his kids' bedtime and story time. So the motion would be just to delay uh, hear it after the next uh, <coughs> decision. <laughs> make a motion. But we will not reopen the public hearing. We'll right. Just make we'll the continue. motion. At the end. <clears throat> yeah. We'll continue to debate it. That's proper from our attorneys. That's okay. Okay. We'll make sure. Yeah. We'll. So without objection of the commissioners, we'll move this item after item 13. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. <laughs> item 13. <laughs> Okay, so item 13 is a proposed amendment to the zoning code. Um, this proposed amendment would, would amend various sections of the Metro Zoning Code to create a new set of zoning districts. These would be referred to as the NS districts, meaning no short-term rental. It does not change the provisions or the permitted uses of any of the existing zoning districts within the Metro Code. I have gone over the short-term rental permit history. This is transgently related as these would create new districts, although this does not change any of the provisions of the existing um, zoning districts uh, in the code. What this would do would create um, a set of new districts, um, primarily within multifamily, mixed use, office, commercial zoning districts. Um, the districts would be mirrors of the of the existing districts. So in other words, RM2 NS would have the same bulk standards, permitted uses of RM2, except for short-term rentals, both owner-occupied and not owner-occupied would be prohibited. There are no other differences between those. And so where you have your MUL district now with those bulk standards, an MUL NS would be created, same bulk standards, same uses, except for owner and not owner occupied short term rentals being prohibited. I do want to note that there are no new R, RA, RS, or RASA districts created. In other words, there are no changes to those residential districts and there are no new districts created for the NS categories of those. <coughs> Staff recommends approval. Um, this adds a new option for applications for rezoning, allowing for additional uses and intensity while also addressing the concerns of neighborhood residents on up zonings. Um, additionally, this is simply a creation of these new zoning districts and does not apply the zoning to any areas um, of town right now. Um, and so staff does recommend approval. Thank you, Lisa. We'll open this item up for public hearing and is the councilman here? You are here. There you are. So uh, you're really the applicant in this instance. And so uh, uh, we'd love for you to come on up and uh, give us your testimony. Absolutely, yeah. You'll go last, and uh, we uh, first and last. So, uh, and we'll give you as much time as you need, councilman, because you're a councilman. <laughs> well, yeah. Thank you all again for for being here this late this evening, and for everybody who has uh, 
come out to, to speak on these items. Um, so th this bill, the, the, what got me thinking about something like this is, you know, coming to before this body over the years and coming to council over the years and seeing a lot of development proposals, um, potential emerging neighborhood centers, things like that, just basically face so much opposition from um, neighbors strictly over the short-term rental use. Um, and I think in a lot of cases, we've kind of missed out on some good projects that, that you know, could have added you know, more of that transit supportive density that we want. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are comfortable with a deli or a coffee shop in their neighborhood with some housing on top of it. But when you, when you, when you bring the, the short-term rental use to that, they're going to say no. They don't want that. They don't want that in their backyard. Um, but deli, coffee shop, and apartments, like, I, I think a lot of people are maybe comfortable with that. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's about um, being able to have conversations in some cases about density and uses without including this very polarizing and contentious particular land use, which, as you've all heard this evening, um, has a lot of supporters and detractors and, and can kind of keep us from focusing on um, building intensity and, um, and, and the density that, that is probably appropriate in a lot of places where it's not now. So um, I will, uh, that's it for my comments for now, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Councilman, appreciate it. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak in support? Come on up. We know the drill. All right, I'll go first again. My name is Omid uh, Yamini, 1204 North 2nd Street, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, you know, not to, uh, I, I will say one thing in regards to what we've heard so far, and, and you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, sensitive and, and very heartfelt stories, but you know, one thing that I would like to, to remind everybody is, is in all of those stories, you know, every one of those units that's now been converted to an STR used to provide housing for an actual person. It used to provide housing for students. It used to provide the mother-in-law suite that, you know, the person that was, uh, you know, a single person would live in, those sorts of things. And those have all been converted to STRs. So the idea that it doesn't impact housing is, in my opinion, a false falsity. But uh, back to this bill, um, I 100% support it. You know, in our neighborhood, we've had uh, a lot of upzoning, and ultimately, the biggest concern with most of the residents when they are these upzoning to multifamily requests is the fact that they would be eligible to be short-term rentals. So this would allow and give us some tools in the toolbox and some flexibility to uh, create some new zoning districts that would hopefully support creating density and actual housing for residents of this city. And that's what I would, I mean, we are in a housing crisis, right? Are we in agreement of that? Could everybody at least agree to that? Um, there is a shortage of housing. Uh, and right behind us, there has been, you know, development on Dickerson Road. Uh, we had a townhouse uh, cluster that went in at nine units, seven of nine, straight STR. Right next to it, they built another one, eight units, eight for eight, 100%. So what are we really creating density for? And, and you know, to add salt to the wound, these guys, these developers are getting uh, building credits for uh, you know being close to transit and things along the corridor, and people can't even live in these places. You know, they are going straight non-owner occupied investor-owned STRs. So again, this is about putting tools in the toolbox, and in my opinion, is a great thinking outside the box, no pun intended, way of addressing this. Thank you. Thank you again, Logan Key, 1411 Fatherland Street in East Nashville. Uh, two points. First of all, keep in mind, all this does is continue to foster a participatory process for people to weigh in on whether or not rezonings in their immediate proximity ought to or not include the ability to have vacation rentals. And that's a very valuable thing, and I think we owe it to our uh, fellow citizens to create that opportunity. Point number two I want to make is this. I live in an urban neighborhood. Uh, as you well know, the urban neighborhoods, particularly those in East Nashville and a couple other communities, uh, have been impacted the most by the proliferation of short-term rentals and vacation rentals. And so the point I want to make there is we have a number of neighborhood corners in East Nashville, uh, old traditionally uh, uh, neighborhood markets and so forth. They've evolved over the years in, into things like bakeries and, and other things. Uh, but these are 
these are properties that are in very close proximity to residential areas, uh, share lot lines with residential areas. Uh, typically, they're MUN or MUL. And so to give those communities the opportunity to, to foster that mixed use, foster that uh, neighborhood corner type commercial activity without the impact of short-term rentals is something that these communities ought to have the opportunity to have at their disposal in council with their uh, council member. And so for those reasons, I very much endorse this bill and encourage you to vote in favor of it. At Williams, 4301 Elkins. For the sake of time, I'd just like to echo what's already been said and to say that I think this would be a very wise move. Please approve it. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. I'm John Summers, 5000 Wyoming. I'm here on behalf of the Coalition for National Neighborhoods. Again, we're trying to fix some of the problems that we created unintentionally when we initially passed the short-term rental bill, things that we never anticipated or would, would have never adopted. Um, this is not a major change. It is a land use change, so this is very much properly your purview in terms of this, but all you're doing is creating a new tool, and I would think as a council person, having been a council person, I would want to have this tool. Um, you know, we've heard a lot tonight about how these other bills are going to impact. Uh, from most of the conversations I, or presentations I heard, I didn't hear a lot of people that were going to be impacted. But you know absolutely no one's going to be impacted by the approval of this tonight because this doesn't exist. All you're doing is creating a new zone that can be used by the council in areas to where um, they feel it's appropriate to have no short-term rentals. Um, I think the council, previous council would have loved to have had this tool. Um, so um, I would urge its adoption. Uh, it's not going to have any negative impact. I don't care what anyone says following behind me because it hadn't been created yet. So no one's going to be impacted on this. I, I did want to say one thing. Uh, when, anytime you do anything with short-term rentals, and that's one of my arguments that I made with, and I'm not sure, Council, I guess you were there, Commissioner Farr, is that if we do the home business, we really will create another situation even worse than this. So I'm just cautioning you as we move, because let's learn from our examples, from our experience uh, in, in terms of, of this. But uh, this is just another tool, and I would urge you to adopt it. And I would want to put a challenge to out these folks out here. I've been doing this for a couple years now. It's never me. I'm not the problem. It's always somebody else. I'm not violating the rules. I'm not creating problems. My neighbors love me. So why do we have so much controversy about these issues? I've yet to have anyone from either the realtors or NASTRA to come and make a meaningful proposal for better enforcement, for better restrictions, to be able to get those bad actors that they all say they're against, but they never support anything, any proposal, any consideration for doing anything different than what we're doing now. Thank you very much. I won't be back for any more. I appreciate coming and spending another evening with y'all on short-term rental. <laughs> I'm sure I'll see you again in the near future. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Summers. Is there anyone else wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. <coughs> Everybody knows the drill. Appreciate you guys coming. Good evening again, Grant Hammond, 342 Harrison Street, Nashville, Tennessee. I uh, want to point out a few things. First of all, <coughs> Council Member Allen uh, had, in 2015, made a single source of funding for the Barnes Fund. Affordable housing comes from a penny tax on all short-term rentals. Uh, they talk about an affordable housing issue. Short-term rentals are helping to solve the affordable housing issue. Fortunately, the Barnes Fund was not funded completely this year uh, because of revenue issues. Uh, that is not caused by short-term rentals. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that on an enforcement front, uh, 19 complaints where uh, a codes person has come to verify as well as police, that person should have been revoked. They should have gone through the BZA and been revoked. It is, it is absolutely horrific that that permit was not revoked. Um, on this bill, this bill affects both owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied short-term rentals. Here's the biggest fear. It is easily foreseeable that any council member unfriendly to STRs would be able to apply for a down zoning to this new NS zoning in a large scale uh, in their district. Um, that measure would go through council in the typical fashion, then through planning commission process, and that does not require individual property owners to consent. 
Um, much like historic overlays, much like uh, conservation overlays, the same process would apply. Um, and many property owners would lose their uh, property rights to short-term lease, both owner-occupied and shorter uh, owner-occupied. Um, I would like for this body to recommend that the new NS zoning cannot be considered unless one of the two following uh, uh, conditions are met. One individual property owner initiates the request for a specific property uh, or properties they own, and in any case of upzoning, the recommendation from planning would go a long way to help this tool not be used in a negative way. You were creating a tool like five infinity stones uh, in the Avengers movies, and you're now giving them to Thanos, who has already said uh, at council meetings that they hate and abhor and, de and despise short-term renting. Uh, I don't think that we can rightfully expect them to act in the proper way. Thank you very much. Beat the Chiefs. Thank you. And before we continue, you know, we, the commission, have given a lot of leeway on, you know, what, what you're speaking about, but let's try to keep our comments on this particular bill, okay? That would be very helpful. Thank you. Hi again. Uh, my name is Deborah Volley. I live at 2445 East Lind Avenue in District 6 in East Nashville. Um, I'm voicing my opposition to BL 2019 111. Uh, the areas where short term rentals are still allowed in Nashville have been confined to non residential areas. There are no more non owner occupied permits being issued in residential areas, and I personally think that that makes sense. Um, but now, why are we further restricting these permits? If the argument is the lack of, of affordable housing, which is an issue in our city, the evidence and the facts do not support this argument against short-term rentals. All short-term rentals in Nashville, in Davidson County, only make up 2% of the housing stock in Davidson County. That's all of them. Since this bill is only affecting non-owner occupied properties, let's just look at that number. The permanent non-owner occupied rentals make up less than 1% of housing in Davidson County. So that argument just doesn't stand up to the facts. Another erroneous argument is that when a property has the ability to be an STR, that it is automatically used as an STR. Having said that, a lot of people, as you've heard in the arguments against the previous bill, want the ability to rent out their home when they go out of town. By eliminating the ability for them to do that in all of these other zones now, if anything is ever rezoned, new developments come along and they can't use it for short-term rentals, they're going to continue to look for homes that have dadus or basement apartments that unintentionally will cause them to stay in residential areas or maybe even increase them in residential areas. Thank you. My name is Pete Prosser. I live at 623 Oakley Drive. I appreciate the uh, commission being here in long hours. I know everybody's got a lot to do. I would simply ask that, you know, the significance of this blanket overlay, if we create it, be given consideration, and I think it would be prudent for a city as a whole that we commissioned a study to see the long-term implications of this. We've heard unintended consequences throughout tonight. Given the, this situation, given that our city is in need of tax revenue, given that the Barnes Fund relies on short-term rentals, I think it would be prudent if a third-party commission study was done so that we can see how this would affect the city's budget with tax revenues. Since we've already been dealing with a $41 million shortfall, would this further create and make it more of a problem for us for, tax, for revenue for the city? We know that the state was, a, was considering, the Comptroller's Office sent a letter to the Metro Council, which we're all aware of, wanting to take over the city's budget and finances. Does this create further problems? I think it's got near-term and long-term implications with regarding to finance, and we, I don't think as a city we would want the state to look at it again that we can't manage our own finances. So I would really like you to consider that when looking at this before we send it up to the, <clears throat> the council that we look at the implications of the, the reduction of uh, income on our tax base. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Taylor Tisch. Uh, I live at 1210 2nd Avenue North. Um, I'm here to speak in opposition uh, of this bill. Um, I come to you not as um, an STR property owner, not as an investor, not as um, a realtor. Um, I come to you as a, a neighborhood advocate. Um, I uh, lived next to um, an STR for a year. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time in Nashville. I've lived here my whole life. Um, 
what I've seen as these zoning regulations have squeezed this market is local Nashvilleians who want to buy and operate short-term rentals are being pushed out of the market. They can't afford to buy these properties anymore. Um, people like that, you know, locals who buy one property to help make ends meet, they're taking really good care of their property. This is their entire investment. This is their livelihood. Um, the properties that are more of more concern um, that I'm hearing from this group today are out-of-state investors, um, people buying big plots of land, running Airbnbs, not being there, don't really care about taking care of their property because they have massive amounts of capital if something goes wrong. Um, as, as the locals are being squeezed out of the market because of these cost restrictions, um, people, like a lot of people in this room who really care about their properties, they, they can no longer operate them. And that leaves a vacuum for these large investors to come in who don't really care about their neighborhoods. So um, I would urge you to consider the impacts on the communities if, I mean, the short-term rental market is here to stay. I think we can see that in this room tonight. So um, I would encourage you to foster an environment where local people who really want to take care of their communities and live in these communities and operate short-term rentals can do so and not make an environment where the only short-term rentals are those owned by large corporations run out of state who don't really care about the communities and the properties. Thank you. Hi, Darren Cunningham again, 1015 12th Avenue South. Um, I believe short-term rentals have a place in Nashville for our tourism sector. Um, I've stated that earlier. Um, also, you know, in regards to this bill, I, I think it's a great bill in some ways, and I actually I appreciate what you've done here because what, and I have some opposition to it, I think it hasn't been well, not well thought out, uh, no disrespect, but I think there's things in here. Sir, if you'll address the chair. That's okay. You just keep okay, talking was, to me. There we go. I'm trying to be polite You're, to him. Yeah, no, no, yeah. keep, that's good. Um, but I think there's some implications here uh, that could be could be pretty catastrophic. So. The idea behind the bill is, hey, we want to rezone, upzone these properties that are currently residential, whatever, and then give them MUN, MU, MUL. Uh, but under that code, you can also short-term rent. And you're thinking, well, I, I didn't want you to short-term rent, and I gave this to you. Now you're short-term renting this, and we're all ticked off about it, and that's where the problems lie. So I understand this bill, and I kind of like it from that perspective. But the uh, because if you want to rezone it, uh, to an MUN, MUL, mixed use, whatever it may be, you should have the ability to do that if that's what's best for your community and then not have short-term rentals in there if that's what your intentions are. That should be uh, a proper thing that's allowed here. So I like the idea of the bill. What I don't like is what you can then do with this extra zoning code, adding in some type of overlay after the fact to an entire street, an entire district, something like that, which would be catastrophic to the area for the people who have bought there already under a certain premonition that was given to them before, and now they can put this overlay in potentially um, that would be harmful to them. So that's the challenge I have with this. So like the other bills, I feel like it's it's got some good intention behind it, needs to be thought out a little bit more, talked, out, talked about a little bit more to understand it all, and then so deferred and then brought back after it's been thought through. Thank you. Mark Wallace, uh, 340 Wandering Circle. Um, I actually agree with the last speaker. I think this is probably a very useful tool to, to add this in because it is a hot topic. Um, it can be ex extremely useful, I think, on multiple projects where they're brought up specifically for that particular property. Um, I think, it, again, I think it could very easily just have a sentence in there stating something like, only intended for individual properties, not for overlays and or um, swaying back and forth with the climate of short-term rentals for years to come, because I think this can have disastrous consequences in 20 years when things change and none of us know what's gonna be happening, but there's some weird zoning out there that says this, and the nature of the, the language has changed by then. The bottom line, I think the initial intent is good. I think we can add some language to it that only allows things going forward and not overlays um, because um, certain council people, for, for not in and not nobody in particular, just has an inkling to take to take all of his district and knock it out, and uh, that can be disastrous. I think in the in the long term. So, anyway, thank you. Hello, I'm Camille Wallen. I'm at 724 Madison, Tennessee. 
uh, 724 Van Oak, Madison, Tennessee. And um, I, I'm not a politician. I've never worked for the commission. I don't have any government knowledge really whatsoever. But I have a question, and I think most people who would have a question would know, kind of know the answer. I do not know the answer. It, <clears throat> in any other uh, zoning, does, in any other zoning for Nashville and the surrounding areas, is there an N in it that means no? In any other zoning, you know, prop that we have, where the, where the N means no? We'll, uh, we can address that when we start talking about the bill, and we can, we can, we'll address that. Oh, I mean, is it, it's just a yes or no answer. Uh, I don't know. I don't think there's an in, but we prohibit uh, lots of zoning. Uh, uh, so I, I, the, the answer to your question is it's more complicated than just a yes or no answer. But I see. We do prohibit lots of uses in very different zoning areas. So. Right. What I feel about this particular part of these three, all three of these, is that we're being targeted. No one else is ever being targeted. You have mixed use places where they can go in there and pretty much do whatever they want short of dealing drugs because it's legal. They can live there, they can work there, they can build a business there, unless you have a short-term property. Unless you have that, then you're not allowed. And my property is an owner-occupied. It is in a neighborhood. It was before all of, all of any of this other legislature. But we keep setting precedent that says, we don't want you short-term rental property owners here. I absolutely think that we should stop targeting short-term rental property. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, good evening. Uh, Brian Merrill, 1320 Pillow Street. Thank you for your time. Um, I've been here about 10 years, so a lot of this is still new to me, but um, never have I seen council attempt to create nearly 40 carbon copy zonings for the sole purpose of excluding one legally permitted use. You know, where's it going to stop? Um, what happens when a council member decides that long-term rentals are the latest and greatest issue? Uh, we're going to get another zone where it's 40-NL, no long-term. You know, at what point does it stop? So I think it ha does have the, the purpose behind it, but the fact that they can go back and change after the fact is, is probably the, where the issue is. Thank you. Hi, my name's Kelly Bradbury, 1412 Sumner Avenue, East Nashville. Uh, my husband and I have spent the last two years um, working on a DADU at our house there in East Nashville, and we did this for several reasons, um, part of which is, is to allow me to work part-time to stay home with my daughter. Um, the thought of if this could change in the future, we, we were still in process of getting our permit. We're actually waiting on fire inspections now, so we haven't even started yet. But um, if this could change in a year, in two years, who is going to make the decision for the rezoning in my neighborhood um, that would there and, and affect my life? Um, the other concern I have is, is I do have three homes that are immediately next to my house that are all full-time, entire house, short-term rentals, um, which is fine. Actually, I've rented those out for my family when they've come to visit because I've, I've got a lot of family out of state. Um, and I've even had some neighbors inquire to me if our property is, is up and running. So for my neighborhood specifically, I think it will hurt my neighborhood if we rezone and say, I'm sorry, you're no longer allowed to do this because I, I think there are some very good beneficial uses to these property, but I do uh, agree that they need to be regulated a whole lot more. Thank you. Hey again, Elise Ranzino, 1027 McCurkin Avenue, 37206. Just this past year, my home and seven others on my street were rezoned from RS5 to RM9, even though the majority of the impacted homeowners, such as myself, shared our opposition with the Planning Commission our council member and Metro council. I discovered the hard way that our consent as property owners is not required or even a concern and the rezoning went through despite our best efforts to, spot, to stop it. In light of my own personal experience, this bill gives me a tremendous amount of concern. Once again, someone, a neighboring homeowner, a council member, a stranger even, could apply to yet again rezone my property, <clears throat> this time to the new NS designation. And once again, my opposition may not matter and without my approval or consent, 
the rezoning could pass. The bill's sponsors have said that this is not the intent. However, the door to this possibility is swung wide open if this bill passes into law. So I respectfully ask you to vote no. Welcome. My name is Tom Kesey, 1101 North 8th Street. Uh, I'm a builder uh, in the area. Um, I, I actually like um, the, the NS as far as on, on stuff moving forward because it does uh, create uh, an avenue for some affordable housing because when we do build the density, the first thing that people want to do is the STR because you get more money on it. So I, I agree with that, but moving that with stuff moving forward, not saying that there would be no more short-term rental, but, you know, in zones that we say that there could be. But as far as being able to just sweepingly move back, I, I don't think that that makes sense. And I think that, that that doesn't give consumers any confidence because you just don't know what we, – we, we don't want to give somebody a loaded gun and just say, hey, you know, take us out. But uh, moving forward, I think it would be a great tool for affordable housing, but um, as a forward-moving tool, not a backwards-moving tool. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none. Councilman, you're up. All right. Thanks, everyone, again, for, for staying with us so late. Um, so I'll, I'll try to be quick, and I just wanted to mention, just to address some of the concerns that were raised um, by the opposition. Um, this is not a blanket overlay. Um, there is, you know, uh, we have a little bit of history in my district with downzoning, um, and you know, I don't think that something like what happened in my district in 2007, where, you know, more or less everything was down zone to RS5, I don't think that could even happen today. Um, but that door is open right now. I mean, the, the process would allow that, as far as I know. I don't believe there was any change to the process. Um, but again, that's not the intent of this, and it's, it's not how I anticipate it being used. Um, Someone talked about the city finances. Um, you know, the, the, the impact of, of, of building more units and more density and having those taxed through traditional property taxes, um, you know, I, I don't have the capacity to do a study to compare that to, we have to see how many of these zones are created and implemented and built. But, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, the fiscal impact is, I, I don't think that's really something that is, is a consideration here right now. Um, and, 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 you know, it's true that some people do want to buy short-term rental eligible units. Um, there are also a lot of people who do not. There are also people who want to buy in a building where they know that that's not going to be happening. I have a, I have a constituent who um, purchased one unit in a 20-unit um, multifamily project on Cherokee Avenue. And he is, well, oh boy, I'm going to out that person now because they're the only person who actually lives there. <laughs> they have 19 um, short-term rental operator uh, neighbors. Same thing on Fern Avenue. Um, same thing with a, with a new um, exclusively STR uh, development on Cherokee. Um, so I, I think that, yeah, more options, more choice is great. But the folks who don't want to um, be in a 20-unit short-term rental complex, I think, should be able to you know, purchase a property in a... In a uh, unit that's that's zoned for the uses they're comfortable with um see the 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 stuff about only allowing the districts to be used for up zonings um you know that's complicated because there's there's different permitted uses in addition to bulk standards with all these different zonings so i'm not sure how we that would be like a major reform of the process i think to actually to actually put codify that um and let's see Oh, the reason it's called NS is just to be extraordinarily clear so that people know what it is they're getting into when they see that label. It's like, boom, okay, um, no questions. Um, and, and the person who was concerned about it, Dadu, um, this, this does not introduce new uh, zoning designations for single or two-family areas. Um, you know, we, we, we thought about it for, for a couple of minutes when we were drafting this thing, and, you know, we, we really feel like those are adequately regulated by, by uh, existing code with regard to short-term rentals. So single and two-family properties, we, d we did not um, introduce any <coughs> designations here. And I, I believe that's all I have. And I, I really appreciate y'all's time and your consideration on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Sims, you want to go first? <laughs> sure. 
Um, okay. Um, first of all, this was really, my hat's off to you, Councilman, for even attempting something like this, because um, I think one of the biggest problems facing our city right now is a lack of tools for really dealing with we're relying on tools that were in many ways created many years ago and then changed with Nashville Next, but then the unprecedented and unexpected growth of our city has kind of given us no tools to deal with. So I can see where this tool would be very helpful, particularly with SP, we're SPing everything because that's the one thing people don't want to have happen. And we've got to do something because we just can't manage all these SPs. I can't get out of my head. Um, March of this last year, and then just revised two months ago, the Economic Policy Institute, which is a very well-renowned, very respected, nonpartisan think tank that does research, released this paragraph, and it's just been shaking me ever since. And it says, the rising costs are a key problem for American families, and we know that's true in Nashville. And evidence strongly suggests, and this is actually an empirical study, it's a meta-analysis, that the presence of Airbnb raises local housing costs. And I think we are at a place where we're going to be able to show that very soon here in Nashville. So anything that we can do to make people actually living in Nashville more affordable, I think we have to do. Having said that, I'm just struggling with how this actually gets implemented and how do neighborhoods decide if I want the whole street done. And so I'm going to look to other people that are more seasoned than I am to help answer some of those questions. But overall, I think the intent of this law is both needed and probably very timely. There's just still some questions about how, how we actually do it that I hope somebody else can address. So. Mr. Gamble? Uh, I, I agree with Dr. Sims. I agree it's needed. I agree it's something we've got to deal with. Let me ask the staff, how do you envision this being it rolled out. I mean, is this going to be when we're doing up zonings and we got a condition that was mentioned earlier where, which we've seen, where the neighbors would go along with it if we could restrict, uh, restrict uh, STRs? Let me offer a couple of broad comments and then maybe if Lisa and, the, and Bob could fill in sort of specific details. I struggled with this one a little bit because we need a sane zoning code. <laughs> and a sane zoning code is one that defines uses based on, you know, community desires for the direction of their neighborhood, but that it also addresses property rights addresses the leadership of sort of the various districts, and we need something that is predictable. And um, one of the hard things, I think, is that right now we do have a wacky tool to whoever was questioning what happens if we have a tool that someone can come in and just remove a use. We have that. It's called a specific plan. And so what's happening right now is we have lots of council members who are introducing specific plans for the sole purpose of removing short-term rentals. And so that's already happening. A healthier zoning code is one that has the base zoning districts expressing the needs of the city. And then you use the specific plan for those very special circumstances where you can't solve the problem unless you have a specific plan. That's if they're natural features, historic features, and the like. On the other hand, I, you know, the idea of not doubling our zoning code, but adding all of these districts felt very unwieldy, you know, because you're adding lots of tools without having to make a decision about where they go away. Although we've already made a hard decision at, with the residential and two, the, with the one and two family. So that core decision was made. So now we're here in this other space. So I landed on a recommendation for approval on this, as unwieldy as it is, because it seemed to me that we needed to give um, the base zoning districts, which is the predictable framework we should have in the future, sanity. And knowing that there is already a tool right now that council members are using to do precisely what you're concerned about. So it's already happening. And when you SP everything for one use, you're creating lots more uncertainty in the environment that folks want to avoid. So uh, to me, this is a move in the right direction for both sides, actually. Um, the only other thing I would say, and Lisa can speak to this a little bit more, um, 
we have lots of, of uses that are restricted in our zoning code check cashing, industrial, I mean, any subcategory. So in some ways, this isn't any different. But non-owner-occupied STRs, I think, are the very hardest permitted use that we have right now in the city because of all the issues, and I'm going to go on about that. But I would, this, so the, in the issue and the concern about whether council members will come in and upzone or downzone without <coughs> consent, we struggle with that at many planning commission meetings. Most council members behave very cautiously with respect to zoning decisions. If you've got lots of people opposed to them, in my experience in Nashville, yes, there are a couple of outliers, but most council members are pretty cautious about that. So if you've got a down zoning and three people don't want it, in my experience, that has been honored and there's a process for addressing that. So I don't see this as different than having a bunch of folks who are in an RS zone district and a councilman proposes to up zone, it's the same process. So I don't wanna leave anyone with the impression that while yes, we're talking about STRs all night, that this is somehow acting outside of the scope of how we would treat any other entitled use or any other property right. Lisa, I'm sorry, I've got many, <laughs> Lisa, do you have anything else you would add in terms of how it's implemented? We make a recommendation to council, I'm going with it. Councilman, uh, council will debate it, and if they're approved, they will be adopted into Title 17 of the Zoning Code. After they're adopted, council members will go to their communities and come to us as they normally would and say, we've decided to do our, I don't know what to call it, the one of these new districts. It will be debated, it will be noticed, advertised, publicly debated here. If a rezoning comes up, you will be noticed of that like you would any other, then it'll go to council. Did I leave anything out? Well, I did wanna add too that it, Thinking about, um, also, I think that when um, the councilman was kind of coming up with this tool, he was also thinking about individual rezoning applications um, that are made by property owners that we're seeing now. There were several of them in this packet. Someone would come in, and when someone comes to the planning department and says, hey, I want to rezone on Dickerson Avenue to MULA, we will say that may be consistent with the policies, planning may be able to support it, but you need to reach out to your council person because zoning of property and changing the zoning of property is a legislative action. And it is up to that council member to carry that legislation. And so if they call the council member and the council member says, I'm not gonna support it, they really don't have a path forward. If the council, but then the council member could say, I would support it if it was one of the NS districts. That gives you a variety of uses, but it gives the community the assurance that they need. And so that would be a way that it would also be utilized on an application by application basis when someone's coming in and asking for additional entitlements. It gives another tool to the council members um, because ultimately a change in zoning is not a right. It's you're asking for entitlements, and so it's a public decision, and it's carried by the council member. And so that was, uh, I think, the primary impetus for this tool. So, that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so be before my head explodes, I'm going to let the others talk. Yeah, that's uh, not But I, I, I understand. I, <laughs> Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, council member, for coming up with this clever uh, zoning uh, classification. Uh, you know, as former council member spoke, I wish I had this tool. I'm sure, you know, previous council member had this tool because there were several parcels, you know, changed to RM. And some, you know, even uh, council member who are carrying the zoning bill said, yes, we would like to have exclude short-term rental to keep the neighborhood neighborhood. but you know, they don't want to go to SP. So if we, you know, if we don't have this tool, every council member who does not agree with neighborhood as a, a consensus don't have, a, you know, short-term rental, uh, they have to go to SP. And that's, it's good in a sense because everybody knows what kind of height, uh, appearance, and so forth. So they will know even what kind of plants will be planted. but. You know, for the property owner <coughs> who won't take, you know, straightforward zone change will be too much. So that will give extra tool. And of course, because it will allow short term rental in the same token, if certain parcel, you know, Dickerson 
road or some ANIOC, wherever it might be, they think it's appropriate to have, you know, RM zoning or MUI, and then appropriate to have a short-term rental in there, they can use uh, just straightforward no NS. So I think this is a really clever tool, and I am um, in support of this stuff recommendation to support. Yes. Thank you. Lisa, tell me when the MUL, uh, MUG zonings were created. Like our mixed use buckets. When were they created? I believe Stuart Clifton was probably on council, I mean, right? The, the straight like MUL? Yeah, MUG? like I, I, I mean, feel those like. have been around for a long time. The A yeah, districts. Maybe the A districts. But so, like, I remember one of those first I mean, use, those first mixed use redevelopments. Or Hillsborough Village. The MUL and the MUG probably go back to Comzo, which was like the zoning ordinance that existed prior to the zoning yeah. ordinance that we have now. Yeah. Um, the most recent, I think, kind of that you could think Update. about was the A districts, mm -hmm. where we created a kind of a new range yeah. of zoning districts. Yeah. Would be like the MUNA, in MUNL, MUGA. Just give me like a rough year. That was. So. so. 2012. 2012. And but so before that, was that to address yeah. kind of um, design issues. Yeah. yeah. But so, like, m as, as little Kathleen grew up in Nashville, <laughs> um, she learned uh, a little bit about land use from, from Stuart Clifton. She learned a lot of land use stories. And and the first kind of examples I was told about mixed use was the, the place at Vanderbilt um, next to, like, where Pizza Perfect, across from, and, and Hillsborough Village. And I kind of have a feeling that when those zoning buckets were created that allowed mixed use and things like that, the arguments we heard tonight from the opposition were probably very similar to the arguments that we heard then. I'm pretty sure that the, the arguments that were that that have gone around any time a new law is created, I know this firsthand, right, because it's what I do for a living, it is is this is a slippery slope and you're gonna use it to 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 for all the worst reasons. But but there are times that sometimes you have to take a risk and you have to do something that gives us a tool to get our hands around something that clearly, as we've discussed for three or four hours tonight and deferred two bills, or probably gonna defer the other bill, uh, <laughs> we clearly can't get our hands around, right? So this gives us a tool, this gives the council a tool because I can't tell you how many conversations we've had that we have said, love to do a straight rezone, but because of the STRPs, we're gonna make you do an SP. And what does that do to my constituents and to developers? It adds to their cost. It adds to their application fee. It adds to staff time. It adds to what we have to spend in Metro government. And quite frankly, I'm ashamed of our previous council members that we didn't think of this earlier, that we could just <laughs> copy and paste the freaking law, the, 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 the zoning code, and just take out permitted use. So, I mean, I understand the concerns. Y'all are worried that we're going to massively downzone all of Nashville. I don't think that the council has the time or or the appetite to do that. I guarantee you that the, the council does not have the time or the appetite to do that. And and if there were, and if there are council members who start abusing this, um, as there were council members who abuse the current zoning code over the last four years, previous terms than that, there are things called term limits and elections, and they have consequences, and that's how you can have your voice heard as well. But with this, what it does is it gives constituents who live near <coughs> short-term rentals the ability to have another say in where they want to live and what they want to live around. This is not a blanket overlay. This is something that could be done on one property. It could be done on five properties. When I ran for office in 2015, I said that I would rezone uh, neighborhoods block by block and street by street, and that's what I did. And that was be the same approach that I would take by this. Um, and I think that, you know, yes, there are some times that you will have dissent when you are rezoning a neighborhood, but overwhelmingly, council members have a lot of angst over rezonings, up zonings and down zonings. Um, with that, I, um, I, I applaud Councilman Parker for being creative. He is very new to the council and still learning, and some people would probably think he's crazy to do this, but I, I think we're just crazy enough that we need to try it. So 
I will let the rest of y'all speak, but uh, that's my testimony, and I ask y'all to give us this tool so we can try to make it work. Commissioner Tibbs. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I'm totally in agreement with this. I think it's a great tool, and it's finally a tool that can be used. Vice Chair. So this one's interesting because when I first read it, I, I this was a very short thing by by no standards in our staff report, especially <laughs> when you look at this whole staff report today. Um, so I first read it, and I and I was like, this doesn't sound good at all. And then I, you know, the argument that the councilman made was very compelling. And I know I, in fact, said many times, probably to you, director, this is really frustrating. We can't approve an RM project here because we're so worried about it bringing in short-term rentals. But this is a perfect place for density. How are we going to get affordability? Da 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 da. You know, my argument there. I, I will simply say the number of times that I have not been able to get a council member to support density where it belongs over short-term rentals has become prohibitive. I mean, it's a huge problem. So, so, that, so I think that from, from creating that tool, it, like the light bulb went off, it just went off late. Like it's a great idea. Um, I do have, I mean, I do understand the concern and I mean, I, I'm thinking of Council Lady Murphy and some of the down zonings that we've seen where I know that, you know, you had, you were doing a block and you had three of the five houses on the block that wanted it and two that didn't. And it was a really hard debate. And I can see those also coming forward. Um, and I think of some of the conservation overlays that we've seen. Mm -hmm. And you might have 80% of the neighborhood behind it and 20% that's not. I do have faith that the councilmen, council men and women, <laughs> ladies, um, have taken the time to meet with their constituents and tried to come up with something that makes the most sense and that you provide good guidance on saying, this block isn't gonna work, I don't think this makes sense, these are the appropriate boundaries for this kind of, so I hope and, and I wanna have faith that that kind of a process will continue with this opportunity, um, but I do recognize that that is a concern um, and I guess as, as this goes forward, I just hope that we can kind of think about any kind of parameters we put around the process just to try to make sure that you don't have a situation where, you know, half the neighborhood is opposed to this and half the neighborhood supports it. Commissioner Haynes. Move approval of the staff's recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> That's a proper motion. Second. And a second. Any other discussion? Uh, I usually don't make a lot of comments, um, but I think this is a, a, an interesting way to address it. I, the one thing that uh, I think we should watch for is in, in the commercial zones, generally where there's hotels and, and, and that sort of thing, uh, that we just make sure that we're not completely zoning out um, short-term rentals in commercial zones. And just for the councilman as well, um, uh, from a apartment or a unit, um, you know, owners of, of those units, the, like a neighborhood association or a building association, uh, have the full right to ban short-term rentals or not in a particular building, just so you know. Um, and that was part of the state law, so just a little clarification uh, on that. That's my only comment. Um, any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, say aye. 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 Says no. Eyes have it. It's adopted. We are back <clears throat> on to item 12. We did reach out to the councilman. The councilman said, Bob, that he was willing to defer to when? He was willing to defer the public hearing at council until March. So, so when would that put our hearing? What's your, so, what's your recommendation? So, Lisa, what's your recommendation? Sure. Um, so <clears throat> you could defer to either meeting in February um, if it so you could defer to either the February 13th or the February 27th. Um, I'm going to reach out to the Metro Council office tomorrow to kind of work, to try to work on some language. I've already let um, Councilman O'Connell know that I would work, reach out to him. So <coughs> we may be able to wrap this one up before the 13th. And so I think a one meeting would be okay. And then if we came to that meeting and needed some additional time, we have the ability to further defer it. And so I think that one meeting is appropriate. Well, that would be consistent with item 11. Yes. So uh, is there a motion to defer one meeting? Yes, so moved. motion to defer one meeting. Motion is second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of deferring item 12, one meeting, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And just a clarification, it, 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 
in the motion, it would open the public hearing back up. So just, that's yes. just, okay. All right, and that's what I assume for both of those items. Um, we are on to I know. the last other remaining business. Anything in historic? No. No, nothing. What about parks? No. Any updates? Or? Council budget is fast approaching. So on behalf of parks and on behalf of planning, Council Lady Murphy, both need more money, especially <laughs> parks. Yes, sir. Hey. Especially <laughs> parks. And planning. And, and planning. We'll okay, talk planning. Thanks. Uh, executive committee report. We don't have anything, Vice Chair, other than uh, notice that our locations are not are uh, February are at the. They're going to be here for the next two meetings. So both February dates, don't the thirteenth and the. So don't go to the other location. Kelly will remind us, it's me especially. Okay. Anything else, Vice Chair? Director's report, anything? Hi, Simone, can you stand up? Okay. Well, I wanted to welcome uh, Simone, who joined the department this week. She's going to be working with Greg Claxton in advanced planning and research, which includes okay. the CIB. Um, okay. She studied and lived in Florida, London, Boston, and Las Vegas. So we can ask her all about what's what's funnest um, Greg interviewed Simone and came back and told me how thoughtful she was and that while you have a policy and planning background you have a lot of experience outside of working in sort of a planning department you have you have a different kind of background which we definitely really um, really need and so I think your sort of financial and sort of policy oriented work will help with the CIB especially. So we welcome you and um, you'll have to present probably next week if that's okay to the Planning Commission right here mm -hmm. and they'll look forward to it. So welcome to the department. Welcome, welcome. to Nashville. Welcome. <laughs> council Lady, anything? I do. Um, last council meeting, uh, I suspended the rule to defer the capital improvements uh, prioritization process. And I'm working with Lucy and Greg and Lisa and all the fun people mm -hmm. to work on that. Um, and I'm trusting that they are adjusting the public hearing schedule appropriately, assuming that we do move the budget up. Typically, as you know, we don't have a, a zoning public hearing in June because of the budget, but now that appears it will be May. So that is being worked worked on, so I appreciate that. And then this isn't directly affecting the Planning Commission, but I think it's important that y'all know this next council meeting, I am introducing legislation updating the lobbyist and ethics code. Uh, I think that a lot of, I've heard a lot of concerns and um, things about people not knowing who are talking to council member, constituents not knowing who are talking to council members about zone changes and things going on in their neighborhood and development and things like that. And I'm hoping to, to you know, try to get input on that. So if, in y'all's free time, in addition to this, please look at that. My plan is to introduce it and immediately defer that until May. And so that gives lots of stakeholders times, neighborhoods to times to hear, because I think it is important when somebody is before the council on a zoning issue and really frankly in, in front of us here that they are identifying whether they are being paid or not to to be speaking on behalf of their client so seeing no other business is there a motion to adjourn so moved or adjourn best motion of the night. that was pretty good though actually all righty it's not oh. even midnight y'all This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.